Now, when it comes to indie car content on this channel, one thing is usually certain. If a video appears in your subscription feed, absolute chaos has happened. That usually means we cover the drama at the Indy 500 or the Nashville Grand Prix, where drivers tend to forget how to, you know, drive. The season opener at St. Petersburg, however, generally doesn't quite bring as much stupidity, despite it being a street track. This year, however, would be rather different. This race turned out to be just as messy as the Sky Sports broadcast I tried to watch it on. We've got a lot to cover, so hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1, and let's break this down. So the 2023 IndyCar season kicked off with 26 world-class drivers and Devlin De Francesco trying to complete 100 laps around the airfield in St. Petersburg. Convenient given how many cars tried to take off over the course of the weekend. But let's start things off by discussing Friday practice, headed up by Scott Dixon and his Ganassi machine. Rookie Benjamin Peterson started his first IndyCar race weekend as he would mean to go on, and by that I mean planting his 55 car into the wall in the opening minutes. Close calls would end up being the order of the day. Last year's race winner Scott McLaughlin trying out death not once, but twice. Christian Lungard then treated his car no better when he slammed it into the wall on his outlap, and Rosenquist welcomed Peterson to IndyCar by requiring the rookie to change his race suit after this move. You're still probably sat there though, thinking this is still pretty tame, right? Oh, just hang in there. Practice 2 would see Colton Herter take the top spot in his number 26 car. For any newcomers out there, Colton on the street track will always lead to one of two outcomes, total domination or a massive accident. Thankfully today would result in the former, though the rest of the field weren't quite so lucky. Drivers were still flirting with the barriers. Newgarden with a close call before Devlin De Francesco's advances were firmly rejected by the St. Petersburg concrete. XF1 driver Roman Grosjean spent the session helping out the fans. Here he is, finding the best vantage point to watch all of the action. The first big crash of the weekend would then come from my new favourite driver due to the sole reason of his name being Stingray Rob. Sadly, Stingray looked like a fish out of water when he rammed it hard into the barriers, though this would still be nothing compared to what was soon to come. Practice 1 pace sitter Dixon was busy trying out some aero kit modifications in the latter half of the session, though I'm not sure his rear wing angle really helped his overall performance here. And it wouldn't aid him much in qualifying either, the six-time champ missing out on the fast six in ninth position. Qualifying was meant to be all about who could set the fastest time around the St. Petersburg aerodrome, though clearly some drivers failed to get that memo instead taking part in the best way to cock up your lap competition. Our first entry comes from Frenchman Simon Paginot, with this fairly tame tap into the barrier. Carl Kirkwood tried the same thing, though gets some bonus points for his flick spin at the end. Clearly though, he thought he could do better, forgetting cars come with a steering wheel through the final corner. Scott McLaughlin then showed he hadn't learnt from practice one when he clipped the wall, sending him into a high-speed spin and out of the Firestone Fast 6. It seemed then that whoever would be able to keep their Indy car in one piece would be a shoe in for pole position, so imagine our surprise when the P1 award went to none other than Roman Grosjean, the Andretti star winning qualifying in front of his family. What could possibly go wrong from here? Well, we'll get to that, but Colton Herter would end up making it a 1-2 for the Andretti team, with the McLaren of Pato Ward and Ganassi of Marcus Ericsson starting just behind them for the race on Sunday. Speaking of the race, that's all we've got to cover, and let's be honest what you actually came here for. This would be Grosjean's best shot at his first win in IndyCar, his first victory in over 11 years, and things got off to a good start when he led away well on lap one. The same can't be said, however, for basically any of the drivers behind him. Felix Rosenquist would make light contact with Scott Dixon through the opening turns, causing chaos in the back as Santino Ferrucci, who decided to show up to St. Pete looking like some sort of anime character, got caught up in a multi-car pileup at the rear of the field. With Devlin De Francesco hitting the highest point his career will ever reach, the red flag was called out, giving everyone just enough time to watch the Bahrain comedy review subtle hint there if you've not checked that out already. On a reel though, this was one of the strangest IndyCar accidents I think I've ever seen. The way De Francesco was launched looked more like something you'd see out of an F122 open lobby than an actual IndyCar race. Hats off to Connor Daly who defied physics making it through the carnage. 
Too bad he wasn't good enough to avoid the wrath of Carl Kirkwood later on, though. That incident would cause caution number two of the day, though it would be tame when compared to what was about to come next. We wouldn't have been racing for more than a lap before Rena's VK stuck it into the tyre barrier again. Jack Harvey's attempt to use quantum tunnelling then failed to work before Carl Kirkwood took the atop and over approach, which didn't fare much better. Rather miraculously, the Andretti machine was still able to continue. Suck on that, Formula 1. Speaking of, ex-driver Roman Grosjean hadn't put a foot wrong in the lead, and in fairness, neither had teammate Colton Herta until he binned it into the wall and brought out caution number 6,053. This abundance of accidents threw any form of pre-race strategy out of the window. Grosjean was still looking strong, but had now been leapfrogged by last year's race winner Scott McLaughlin. With one pit stop to go, both drivers were trying to leave it as late as possible, knowing that just one more caution before their stop would wreck any hope of a victory. And come, that caution did. Thankfully, just after both drivers had made that crucial final pit stop, the only snag being that the caution was for them. Exiting the pits on cold tyres, McLaughlin was going to struggle to keep the experienced Grosjean behind. He admittedly did achieve this, but used a method that didn't make the Frenchman particularly happy. All that chaos promoted Pato Ward into the lead with 20 laps remaining. Great news for McLaren, especially given all their technical niggles in Formula 1 earlier that day. Now I wonder where this is going. Oward's car hit the pit limiter coming out of the final corner, granting the race lead to none other than Marcus Ericsson, who seems to have a knack of winning races I decide to cover over here on the channel. When we thought the race was about to settle down, Joseph Newgarden provided a last little bit of entertainment when his car turned itself into a barbecue in the closing laps. But none of this stopped the Swedish might that is Marcus Ericsson, who finally crossed the line to claim a sensational victory to start the 2023 season. Oward and Dixon would round out the podium in a race where only 12 of the 27 runners that started finished anywhere near the lead lap. So this race really had it all and really helped wake us up after the Bahrain Grand Prix. We had action, fantastic wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, and some less good examples of that as well. If you didn't watch my video last week on why you need to watch IndyCar this season, this weekend really sums that up in a nutshell. I stand by my comment that it beats F1 for excitement nowadays. So if you enjoyed the video, be sure to let me know by smashing those like and subscribe buttons and telling me your thoughts on the race down in the comments below. So the first race of the 2023 IndyCar season was a little bit mental. Now, when I covered that race, I wasn't planning to do the full IndyCar season. Then I looked at the view count and, well, hello again. I just want to start this off by saying a huge thank you for all of the support on that last video. To all the new subscribers, patrons and channel members, it really means a lot. And I feel the best way to pay you guys back is simply to get into another race. And round two with the Texas 375, which was, in the words of the drivers themselves, beautiful chaos. Let's get into it. This was, of course, the race that last year saw one of the greatest finishes in the sport's recent history, Joseph Newgarden making a last corner pass to snatch victory away from Scott McLaughlin. The young New Zealander has obviously come a long way since then, as we saw in St. Pete. He'll now take you out before letting you take that win. Jokes aside, the start of the weekend's action was a bit on the quiet side. Reigning champion Will Power announced a new deal with Penske, but besides that, nothing really happened. Then we got to first practice, where nothing really happened. Then qualifying, where Felix Rosenquist took pole. And other than that, nothing really happened. The first oval of the year was surprisingly lacking in the mistakes department, especially surprising given that Devlin Di Francesco was still trundling around somewhere. McLaren seemed to be the ones with the most dominant car, though. Rosenquist never really looking challenged from those behind, and Rossi and O'Ward lining up third and fifth, leaving many to wonder, where exactly was this pace in their Formula 1 operation? It wouldn't actually be until final practice that we saw the first oopsie from one of the drivers, Connor Daly pulling an April Fool's prank on his spotter and engineers by giving them all heart attacks. It would be Scott Dixon topping the times heading into the race on Sunday, which you'll be glad to hear actually has something I can talk about. 250 laps around the Texas Motor Speedway would get underway with several cars contracting what looked like explosive diarrhea as they dipped a wheel into the dirt at turn one. Rosenquist would hold the lead though, 
well he was, until he decided he didn't actually want it anymore, handing P1 to Dixon at the end of lap 1. First place would then jostle amongst the leading pack like a hooker at a corporate after party until everything changed on lap 48 and the first car made it into the Texas barriers. Said car was the number 11 of Takuma Sato, the Japanese driver making his return to the series with new team Ganassi, only to find out the Chastain approach doesn't work so well in IndyCar. As Kingpin fumed in the garage, everyone, and I mean everyone, took advantage of the subsequent caution to take a cheap pit stop. This would end up proving a little more expensive for the Andretti of Kyle Kirkwood, who found out he couldn't just drive through Alex Rossi like he was on a Seto Corsa. Rossi picked up suspension damage from the accident and was only left further infuriated when he was appointed blame from the stewards and had to serve a drive through penalty. I'll be honest, I don't really know where I stand on this one, besides being happy IndyCar's Twitter fan base is considerably smaller than other top-flight motorsports. The race would restart then, with New Garden and Polo now shuffled to the front of the order, and as they competed for who had the biggest bull sack, Kirkwood's day was about to fall apart when his car started resembling a chain smoker just shy of half distance. Still, things could be worse. For example, you could be Felix Rosenquist, who found the Texas Motor Speedway far more challenging when his car was reduced to just three wheels rather than four. This was especially bad for McLaren, as by this point their one remaining car of O'Ward was on another planet, lapping the 28-car field up to third and looking to take a dominant victory. The caution for Rosenquist's accident pretty much threw this plan in the bin, set fire to said bin, then dropped a nuke on what was left for good measure. The likes of Newgarden and Polo were able to swap onto a far more advantageous strategy. They could push all the way to the end, whilst the McLaren held track position, though would need to aggressively fuel save if they wanted to go the distance. When the race restarted, O'Ward took one look at these fuel targets and felt it was best just to completely ignore them, racing New Garden and Polo to the bone. McLaren's only saviour would be another caution, but given how well behaved the field had been over the entire weekend, the likelihood of this was pretty low. Then again, Stingray Rob is in the field, and he was about to do Stingray Rob things on lap 208. The Delcoin racing car glanced the outside barrier before being spat across the circuit and hard into the inside fence. Stingray was okay, though I'm starting to get the feeling his IndyCar career is about as endangered as the animal he's named after. For those still running, more gambles were taking place. This time it was Grosjean and Dixon who chose to stay out and take track position, with the rest of the field, though Ward included, heading to pit road for fresh tyres and fuel. Now no one realised it at the time, but Roman and Scott had played a blinder here. The pair had assessed the situation and concluded that Devlin D. Francesco was still in the running, so there had to be at least one more caution when he inevitably had his massive accident. Sure enough, just a couple of laps into the restart, that's exactly what happened. The Andretti wiping out Graham Rahal for good measure, though given the nightmare he was having at the rear of the field, I imagine he was more thankful for Devlin just putting him out of his misery with this one. With just a handful of laps to go then, we were set up for a phenomenal finish to the second race of the season. New Garden Ward led the way, with Herter and Polo snapping at their heels. This was especially impressive for the latter, Alex on the most worn tyres of the leading pack, yet still able to make a strong challenge for the win. Even David Malukas, who seemed to be way out of contention just a few laps prior, was now back on the winning strategy and looking for his first win in the category for Dale Coyne. And you weren't able to count out the likes of Grosjean and Dixon either, since both of them pit under the final caution. As the laps ticked down, their tyre advantage became better and better. What that left us with was a brilliant showing from all involved, the leading pack going side by side for what seemed like an eternity, millimetres from both each other, and the mother of all accidents. It seemed like a matter of time before one of them threw their Indy car at high speed into a wall, and eventually, that's exactly what happened. Just as he looked to build up race winning momentum, Grosjean clipped the rear of Malukas, sending him into a spin, straight into the barrier with just two laps left on the count. The subsequent caution brought an end to the race, Newgarden just ahead of O'Ward at the time and thus able to take a stunning victory around the Texas Motor Speedway. Maybe not quite as high stakes as the one from the year before, but pretty darn close nonetheless. You've got to feel a little bit for O'Ward. Once again, he came close to a win, only for matters outside of his control to wreck that for him. I wonder if him and Charles Leclerc have a little focus group going on during the off weekends. On the bright side, he does move up into the lead of the Drivers' Championship, which I'm not going to delve into much as we're way too early in the season to even be talking about that yet. It's also gutting for Grosjean seeing another potential victory fall away due to another crash, though this one was completely on him and quite frankly I think it would have been a long shot anyway. 
we were simply running out of laps. A fantastic race overall though, and thankfully we don't have so long to wait this time before round 3 kicks off at Long Beach on April 16th. You can bet I'll be covering that race too. When designing the 2023 calendar, the boffins over at IndyCar looked at the one month gap between rounds 1 and 2 of the season and thought, yeah, that looks about right. Thankfully, for the sake of our sanity and my YouTube revenue stream, we've only had to wait two weeks till we got to round three of the championship, held at Long Beach in California. The name may be familiar to the Formula 1 regulars of the channel, the track hosting the championship in the 70s and 80s, before realising F1 was about as good of an investment as anything Logan Paul sets his hands on these days. More recently, the track has been used by a variety of the American categories, including IndyCar, obviously, or why would you be here? We've got a lot to cover this weekend, but first it's time for another soppy thank you from me for all the support on the recent videos. You guys are absolutely killing it right now, and a massive shout out to all the new patrons and channel members. Right, with that out the way, let's jump into round three of the season. So with two races completed, several key questions were floating around the paddock. Could new championship leader Patawo Ward build on his good start to the season? What could Penske and Joseph Newgarden bring to the equation? And on what lap would Romain Grosjean bin it into the wall? Who could predict all of those would age incredibly badly by the end of this video? As far as news was concerned, everything was a little bit quiet, with the exception of McLaren launching their Indy 500 liveries and making any diehard fan of the sport require a new pair of underwear in the process. We didn't need much in the build-up to this one anyway. This is Long Beach after all. A track with so much character and history, even before the designers thought, hey, let's just chuck a fountain in there as well. Practice 1 would get underway with O'Ward topping the times at the end of the session. Things weren't going so well though for Jack Harvey, who attempted the get around the fountain without using your steering wheel challenge, the Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan car nosing itself into the tyre barrier. You know, one day someone will just go straight through that dolphin and I'll be able to make a much better joke here. Graham Rahal wasn't faring much better, at one point even attempting to drive the circuit in reverse for some reason. But despite a few more close calls for the leading drivers and Helio Castroneves, that was really all the drama in FP1. But don't worry. FP2 would be sure to make up for that. We were barely five minutes into the session before Callum Mylock got homesick and attempted to use Turn 8 as a launch pad to take him back to the UK. With the red flag coming out, you might think drivers would take it easy after seeing that one. But these are Americans. They go big or they go home. Rena's VK would go straight into the tyre barrier instead. With two identical incidents then, a few eyebrows were raised amongst the teams, and sure enough, it turned out Long Beach had added an extra curb on the inside of the corner overnight, then forgot to tell anyone about it. As Ilot embraced the USA and went straight to Sioux, cars were re-emerging onto the track, and into the wall if you were willpower. The Aussie was also helping out the young guns when he made the IndyCar version of the human centipede with Kyle Kirkwood. It would be O'Ward on top once again though, in what was shaping up to be a stellar weekend for the Mexican. Gee, I wonder what could possibly go wrong. For David Malukas, as it turned out, quite a lot. A Delcoin racing driver reverting to the oval aero kit in quite rudimental fashion. That would be the first crash in a dramatic qualifying session. The pit stop boys claim they'd rather see Marcus Armstrong pick up goals than race. Maybe that's because his Riz is about as good as his ability to navigate turn 9 in one piece. Pato Award, at least, was still on top of the times, by such a margin that his team came over the radio telling him to save tyres and slow down. Down. Words that the Mexican clearly hasn't bothered to learn yet. Having given his entire Arrow McLaren team heart attacks, he did manage to progress into the Firestone Fast 6, but it wouldn't be pole position for the Mexican. That would go to Andretti's Kyle Kirkwood, who finally remembered he was actually good and shot to his first P1 award of his career. Ericsson and Grosjean would line up behind as we got ready for Sunday, and what was bound to once again be utter chaos at Long Beach. And boy, we weren't disappointed. There was drama off the start before we even got down into Turn 1. The mid-pack deciding they couldn't be asked to wait for Kirkwood and started the race early. Helio Castroneves found a new way to avoid all this drama, spinning himself into the wall before it even cleared the first corner. So we'd barely managed 100 meters and the first pace car of the day was out. When we finally got racing again, Kirkwood still led from Eriks and Grosjean on a new garden. That order wouldn't stay the same for long though. Newgarden would become the first man to overtake the DHL Honda and not find his car wedged somewhere in a barrier. Callum Eilot didn't actually need the Frenchman. He was too busy ruining his own race when he clipped the outside wall of Turn 1. 
And I'll tell you what, I don't think they've moved that one overnight. It's been a while since we checked in on O'Ward. His early pace seemed to have gone out the window, and instead he was spending his time playing the game of how many IndyCar drivers he could piss off over the next couple of hours. His first target was six-time champ Scott Dixon. Pato using his car as a conveniently placed brake pedal in an incident he's apparently not sorry for. That'll win people round, well done. With another safety car, it was time for everyone to head into the pits. Well, almost everyone. Canapino opting to stay out and become a newly formed Turn 12 around the 11-turn Long Beach circuit. His teammate Calamilot chose to come out of the pits and lap down and join in on the melee. Then Castro Neves came out of the Shadow Realm, tagging Canapino and hindering Kirkwood. The Andretti driver dropping positions as the McLaren missile joined in for round two. IndyCar's new most hated driver was now way down the field much to the delight of the leading pack who didn't have to deal with his lack of a brain anymore. This meant, I think for the first time all year, an IndyCar race actually settled down. Hell, even Colton Herter was keeping it out of the wall. And that's driver of the day material in my opinion. As Benjamin Peterson reminded us that he was an IndyCar driver this year, I'll admit for a little bit I missed having Jimmy Johnson in the field. That at least would have brought us one more caution to contend with, but we could at least appreciate strategy. Well, not Joseph Newgardens, as his engineers were clearly on crack. The Penske's long run at the end of the race was never going to work. Dropping him further and further back, that placed the fight for the lead between Kirkwood and Grosjean, who amazingly was also still in the race at this stage. We were set then for a frantic end to the Grand Prix. The Frenchman had saved up all of his push to pass all race long, hoping to snag his first race victory in about a million years. This was a good call, but his team weren't having any of it. In the end, Grosjean was only allowed to use 30 seconds of his push to pass, leaving the Phoenix stranded in P2 for a second Grand Prix of Long Beach in a row. Did Kyle Cook would have any sympathy for him? I doubt it. He would be the one to cross the line in P1 for his very first IndyCar win. It's been a tough start to the year for the Andretti driver. After hitting that high point in St. Pete, things weren't looking great for him. So hopefully this win can ignite a fire in the American. Which is a joke I can't safely use had Grosjean won. Overall then, a pretty decent outing once again for Indy. The race did have its dull moments, but O'Ward sure kept us entertained. Even if it was at the cost of his credibility. It's another two week gap before we head over to Baba Motorsports Park for the fourth round of the series. And I'll be making plenty of content in the meantime, so be sure to get subscribed for that. The Azerbaijan Grand Prix was, let's be honest, incredibly boring. As a result, our expectations were already low coming into the second race this weekend, IndyCar's round at Barber Motorsports Park, or to give it its official name, the Children's of Alabama Indy Grand Prix. Children who, given it's Alabama, are probably inbred. Coming into the fourth round of the season, Marcus Ericsson led the championship from Pato Award, the Mexican still scrambling to pick up his reputation after leaving it in the Long Beach tyre barriers. What chaos would he and the rest of the grid get up to this time round? Well, hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review for the Grand Prix of Alabama. So if you're new here, this is usually the section of the video where we talk about any news there's been prior to the weekend. This time, however, all the news comes from the world of Twitter and the fallout after the Grand Prix of Long Beach. After the Juncos cars got caught up at the restart, the Argentine fans of Augustin Canapino tried to rip Calamilot a new one, to the point where IndyCar themselves had to put out a statement on the matter. All I'm going to say is it's not the first time the Argentinians have overreacted with the Brits, is it? Besides that, nothing of note has happened in the last couple of weeks, meaning it's time to move on to first practice at Barber Motorsports Park. As you'll see, this ended up being quite action-packed, Patuo Ward kicking us off by practicing his technique on the advertising boards around the circuit. Helio Castroneves, meanwhile, found the high point of his season as he launched his Autonation car off the curbs. That sent him through the gravel and into the wall, the entire crash pretty much summing up his career. As Grosjean caught fire again, attention turned to the Rahal Letterman Lanigan cars. Graham Rahal being held up by teammate Jack Harvey, this incident making Rahal so angry, he momentarily joined the Third Reich. <laughs> it's not going to get me in trouble. Probably, let's just move on. Will Power was next to find the wall, the reigning champion skidding through the gravel in the closing moments of the session, topped by Scott McLaughlin in the number three car. Practice two, at least, was slightly less eventful, though Castro Neves was still able to have his incident. Don't worry about that. Rookie Benjamin Peterson continued his quest of investigating the runoffs at each track we visit this year, while Herter and O'Ward were busy scaring their respective mechanics with these saves. P2 ended then, with 2021 winner Pelot on top, as Indy geared up for qualifying, 
That said, Championship leader Marcus Ericsson didn't seem to get that memo. He was the big name knocked out in round one. Colton Herter found himself out of the fast 12 as well. And shout out to Augustin Canapino. The Argentinian seems stoked about his qualifying effort. Doesn't change the fact he finished 22nd though. As Armstrong made himself a new friend, it was time to progress to round two. Alex Pelot setting the benchmark early on, Roman Grosjean soon displacing him as attention turned to those on the bubble. Scott Dixon looked under threat from Will Power as the session came to an end. That was until Power got himself lost at the hairpin, with Rinas VK celebrating his 50th IndyCar start with some lawn mowing. That left us with just six cars to the side pole position, and this final session was really all about one man, Jimmy Johnson. No, sorry, it was, it was Roman Grosjean. The Frenchman picked up P1 award number two on the year, making us all wonder how his weekend would come crashing down this time. Before we find that out, I do want to quickly take the time to thank you all again for all the recent support on these IndyCar videos. I honestly never expected them to do this well, so a huge hello to all the new subscribers, and a special shout out to those of you who've now begun to support me as a patron or channel member. It's completely optional, of course, but if you do want to get involved, all the links you need are down in the description below. Right, now I've finished begging for money, let's get on to the race, shall we? Rain Overnight presented us with a green track ahead of race day. That meant we would do a bit of a crazy one. Exhibited well in the Indy Next support race, this event needing to be red flagged because a recovery vehicle got stuck in the mud. I swear to you I'm not making that up. As the main event got underway, Grosjean comfortably led from P1. As Polo and O'Ward sparred for second place, Big props to the McLaren driver here for not wiping anyone out this time round. Now into second, though Ward would make an attempt on the lead, Grosjean responding with the IndyCar version of the middle finger as he ran the Mexican out wide. Polo was next to have a go, with Grosjean again able to just about stay in front in what was quickly turning out to look like a race-winning drive. Can you see where this is going? We'll return to that later, as the cars were now all focusing on strategy. Most of the field trying their hardest to hold it out to lap 30 before making their first pit stop. And if trying so hard but to no avail could be summed up in any of the drivers on the current grid, that would be Colton Herta. The 26 Gamebridge Honda having to bail two laps earlier than planned, and I hope you enjoy seeing that yellow livery machine as that's basically the last we saw of her to rule afternoon. The early pit stop phases put O Ward and Dixon on track together for the first time since the Mexican role played as a missile last time out in Long Beach. To everyone's surprise, however, they managed not to wipe each other off the face of the planet this weekend. O'Ward being well behaved sure limited the number of cautions we were going to see, and it was a strange race for IndyCar as even Devlin Di Francesco was able to stay on the black stuff. At least we could turn to Stingray Rob then to spice things up as his car ground to a halt on lap 38. That caused a flurry of action on pit road, those who hadn't pit yet trying to get in before the caution came out. That didn't put Roman Grosjean in the best of positions. He still maintained the lead, but now had Scott McLaughlin on fresh rubber right behind him. And we all know how that turned out last time. The race would restart on lap 43 with Grosjean on the defensive, which to his credit, he was able to do very nicely. Though when he came into pit, Scotty Mack was able to push in clean air to attempt the overcut. While we all waited to see how that would pan out, we got to witness Joseph Newgarden, who'd found himself royally screwed by Stingray's caution, getting mugged off by anyone and everyone. It was so bad, even Alex Rossi made it by. We'll return to Grosjean though, when McLaughlin looked to have initially made the overcut work in his favour. Cold Firestones were about to bite him on the arse, however, treating us to a fantastic lap-long battle that I really can't make any jokes about. Besides saying it's nice to see Grosjean's overtaking has come on since 2012. Also, as a message to anyone on Twitter who tried to say this wasn't fair racing, please do us all a favour and jump out of a window. Things were looking all good for Grosjean then, until we got to see how much push the pass the Frenchman had left. If you're not catching my drift, I'll give you a clue. It's the same number of fans Santino Ferrucci has. That was enough to give McLaughlin a fresh lease of life, as we were set up for a thrilling scrap with 21 laps remaining. This thrilling scrap would just last two tours, however, as it was time for Grosjean to throw it away, the Andretti driver going sightseeing at the hairpin, and practically allowing Scotty Mack to slot into the race lead. In Grosjean's defence though, I don't think he would have been able to hold on anyway. As the number three car sailed off into the distance, the only thing that might have saved Rogro was a caution period. That yellow never came, but we sure came close to one when Simon Pagano, or Simon Pagano if you were listening to the UK commentary, nearly sent Tylot Skyward after the Brit threw one down the inside. 
Maybe someone needs to remind Simon or Simon or whoever that he's not trolling on iRacing anymore. There were no such issues for McLaughlin, however. He came across the line to make it four different winners in four races, Grosjean holding on to second after Will Power came out of nowhere in the closing stages. Another race then, and another missed opportunity for Roman Grosjean. You've got to start wondering what god he must have pissed off in the offseason, but you'd like to think, given the pace of that Andretti car, that first win can't be too far away now. The month of May is finally upon us. That means we're only two weeks away from watching 29 great drivers and Devlin Di Francesco hurtle around 500 miles of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Before that, though, we've got to put up with the road course instead. On the bright side, the GMR Grand Prix at least doesn't have a name I can cancel myself over. Those who aren't sure what I'm on about can just watch the first 30 seconds of my last IndyCar video. Before we get into things, though, I do have a couple of announcements. Firstly, a big thank you again for all the recent support on all the comedy reviews, and if you end up enjoying them, be sure to drop them a like and subscribe to the channel, as that, funnily enough, really helps me out. And if you're watching this video on release, it's also my birthday. If that's not a piss poor reason to subscribe, I don't know what is. Right, let's get into the comedy review. So as I said, the GMR Grand Prix sees IndyCar head to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the first of three events on the 2023 schedule. Now, whilst the Oval later in the month carries perhaps more of the fame, the road course on the circuit infield presents its own unique set of challenges. For example, the final section bringing you back onto the Oval requires drivers to get as close as they can to the barriers, though if you manage to hit a wall anywhere else, something must have gone horribly wrong. As far as far as news goes, heading into the weekend, there wasn't a whole lot doing the rounds. Despite Grosjean still being a bit grumpy over losing yet another win to Scott McLaughlin last time out in Alabama. I'm not too sure what he's got to worry about though. He's been arguably one of the most consistent drivers pace-wise this year, and took his first pole at the Indy Road course back in 2021. So I'm sure he'll be straight on the pace this weekend. I say that like I haven't, just watched Friday qualifying. We've got practice to cover before that, though. Benjamin Peterson getting a taste of the wall at Turn 1, whilst Alex Rossi was too focused on something else as he drifted wide into the barrier at the end of his flying lap. Devlin DeFrancesco had a strange error-free weekend last time out in Alabama, to the point where I wondered if he was really the one driving the car. Worry not, though, as the Andretti driver was back to his usual self this weekend forgetting he was on the road course when he went straight at turn one, then taking his frustrations out on a bollard as he tried to find the racetrack again. Now, what did that ever do to him? Andretti's weird Friday was nowhere near over, as Colton Herter and Roman Grosjean seemed to have swapped fortunes. Roman was just plain underwhelming, and Colton was on fire. The cars sure seemed to be taking a bit of a battering, with the track, and especially pit road, a lot more grippier than anyone expected. This was damaging cars' clutches and causing a raft of reliability issues, but on the bright side, this is probably the fastest Helio Castro Neves has gone all year. Kirkwood's engineers tried to solve this problem by pushing the American around the circuit, giving up quickly after realizing they might struggle to beat the fastest time that way. Meanwhile, Santino Ferrucci even suggested pouring water onto his grid spot. This was a surprisingly clever solution, made even more surprising given it came from the brain of Santino Ferrucci. O'Ward and Polo would top practice one and two respectively, leaving us with qualifying to round out Friday's action. The first part of said quali session was about to see the order well and truly mixed up. Big names like Newgarden, Grosjean and Canapino all failing to make the cut. They would join the rest of the dropout regulars as the remaining 12 cars geared up for round two. The shocks here would continue, Ericsson, Dixon and Power were all unable to progress, though the spotlight was on the number 45 car of Christian Lungard. The 21-year-old Danish driver was on fire throughout all of qualifying, going on to grab pole ahead of Rosenquist, Polo and Harvey. Yeah, sorry, what's he doing here as well? It was a mixed up grid then, and with potential rain in the air, this was going to be a cracking race. So let's not waste any more time and get right into it. As the cars got into formation, everyone thought the battle for P1 would be between pole sitter Lungard and Alex Polo behind. What we didn't anticipate was Benjamin Peterson coming from absolutely nowhere. The rookie got his five seconds of fame as he peeled into the pit lane to effectively retire. He did re-emerge four laps down later in the race, but then just did his typical thing of trundling around and... I don't know... 
being Benjamin Peterson. Anyway, everyone else was busy hurtling down towards turn one. Lungard held the lead, but teammate Graham Rahal was less lucky, his machine turning into a pinball as it was battered between cars and sustained heavy damage to the rear. Incredibly, everyone was still pointing in the right direction, though. Stingray behave. David Malukas threw an ambitious move down the inside of Scott McLaughlin, the Kiwi another to sustain damage in the turn one melee. As he battled to stay alive, Polo managed to slip ahead of Lungard and into the lead. We'd had a lot of action then on lap one, but the drivers had, for the most part, raced fair so far. They got bored of that by lap two, however. Stingray Rob and Roman Grosjean were busy playing a game of who had the biggest bull sack on the brakes coming down into turn seven. Unfortunately for Stingray, he ran into a wild David Malukas, wiping both drivers out of the GP. There seemed to be a little debate over who was at fault in this one. However, given only one of these drivers follow me on Twitter, Stingray, your name isn't saving you this time. That brought out an early caution, and more drama was soon on its way. Will Power forcing Carl Kirkwood off the track at T1. I don't know how Kirkwood took this, but given he then proceeded to pile drive power off into the grass, I'm going to assume he wasn't best pleased. Kirkwood was penalised for his actions as Polo decided he was going to be a 2023 Red Bull and stormed clear on the alternate tyres. The Red Bull rubber wasn't loved by all, however. Grosjean and Newgarden pitting early on lap 18 to throw them in the bin. And hats off to Joseph here for not murdering his pit gun in the process. Polo was next to bail onto the primaries, promoting Lungard back into the lead. The Danish driver needing to push, being on the opposite strategy. That was hindered somewhat by his own teammate though, who had got into P1 by just not pitting. But was now moving so slowly, the AMR safety team were checking he hadn't stopped on circuit. Ray Hall was then about as useful as a soggy tissue as he held up Lungard and got himself an invite to Alex Pelot's next birthday party. Meanwhile, Roman Grosjean finally made it past Scott McLaughlin, only it wasn't for the lead this time, just 14th place. Back to the battle for P1, and it all seemed to be going in the direction of Alex Pelot. The Spaniard was on supreme form and blitzed past Lungard, before disappearing off into the distance. Tell you what, that rain would sure be nice around now. Oh, never mind, it's missed the circuit. Thanks for nothing. Lungard's race was falling apart, and we'd watch in despair as the Danish driver plummeted out of podium contention in the second half of the event. If you were an Alex Rossi fan, though, I imagine you were slightly more cheerful. The American switch to McLaren has been a bit of a dumpster fire so far, but at the place of his most recent IndyCar win, he conveniently remembered how to drive again, and was now up to third behind O'Ward. Neither could challenge the unstoppable force that was Alex Pelot, however. The number 10 Ganassi car came across the line on lap 85 to take his first win on the year. Talk about a statement to everybody else. In all, it was maybe one of the quieter races we'd seen from Indy this year, but the strategy battles were still really interesting to watch. It's really a shame that we never got that rain. I feel that it would have made all the difference in this one. Just watch last year's highlights to see what I mean. Next up for IndyCar is the big one the Indy 500, and you can bet I'll be covering that race here on the channel with a ton of stuff in between. So be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss a single one of those uploads. 33 drivers, four turns, 500 miles. This is the Indy 500, the jewel and the crown of American motor racing. Or if you're Stingray Rob, another opportunity to bin yourself into a barrier. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the comedy review as the IndyCar season heads to the greatest spectacle in racing. See, I got it right this year. The Indy 500 really has no comparison. 500 miles of a simple oval, it sounds easy to the uninformed pleb. In reality, there's a reason why this race needs more practice sessions than I have passive income streams. The Brickyard bites. One small mistake, and you could end up like poor Stingray here. The 2023 edition of the race spelt this out perfectly, ending in what some are describing as quite controversial circumstances. I guess that comes down as to whether you're a New Garden fan or not. We've got a lot to dive into then, so let's not waste any more time and get into the comedy review for the 2023 Indianapolis 500. Now before we get into the racing itself, I think it's apt we look at some of the new liveries gracing the grid this year. Yes, even this one. My personal favourites had to be the main McLaren trio of Award, Rossi and Rosenquist. The team was celebrating their 60th birthday, or 60 years since they were actually good. The Triple Crown homages were fantastic. Santino Ferrucci's patriotic trash can on the other hand, 
less so. For those who are maybe unaware, Santino doesn't have a whole lot of fans across the pond, mainly down to his stint here in Europe, where he was basically a bit of a cut. Honestly, I'm surprised Ferrucci's car wasn't fitted with a foghorn and missile striked an innocent family in Iraq every time it crossed the finish line. I'm sure this livery will be loved by some, but as someone who's about as patriotic as a foreign migrant, it just makes me want to be sick. Along with the new liveries, IndyCar were introducing some new rules for the 2023 edition of the race. These included the removal of double points, upgraded aero devices, and rear wheel tethers to prevent them from flying off the car during an accident. Safe to say, these worked out really well. Anyway, let's take a look at some of the big names heading into this race, and the storylines that were already shaping up throughout the month of May. First of all, we've got to talk about Tony Canaan. The popular Brazilian was back on the grid for his last ever race in IndyCar. He won the 500 back in 2013, and aimed to go out with a bang. Hopefully not like his attempt in 2009, though. Ryan hunter Ray was also back driving for Dreyer and Reinbold Racing, though if I'm honest, I don't think anyone particularly cared. As for the regulars, Marcus Ericsson took the 500 win in dramatic fashion last year, and would want to do so again, if not for the pride and fame, then for the extra $400,000 bonus awarded to the next back-to-back -back winner of the race. This is America, after all. He'd be under threat from 20. 2023 title rivals Alex Pillow and Patawo Ward, and we probably shouldn't count out Joseph Newgarden as well. He may not have won the 500 before, but has been dominant on other ovals in the past, including a win at the Texas Motor Speedway earlier this year. Finally, there was Stingray Rob. Once again, he's simply here because he has a cool name, and that's about it. Oh, and he might hit the wall later on. Anyway, I've rambled for long enough, so I might as well start covering the actual on-track action. Now, since the race has about a million different practice sessions, rather than covering them all in depth, here were the headlines coming into qualifying. In the past, the Speedway has generally been dominated by Honda power, and while the Chip Ganassi cars were still topping the timesheets, a few Chevy-powered drivers were starting to make an impression. Team Penske's Joseph Newgarden managed to set the fastest average speed in the first open test back in April, and perhaps more surprisingly, the AJ Foyt cars of Santino Ferrucci and Benjamin Peterson presented themselves as potential frontrunners as practice rolled on. I guess we were all lucky that Peterson wasn't attracted to the Indianapolis runoff like he has been in other races this season, mainly because Indianapolis runoff is usually a metal fence. On the other side of the equation, we find the Andretti cars, who were filling their typical oval role of being profoundly underwhelming. Could always be worse, though. You could be driving a Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan car. Come qualifying, they were the ones who were struggling. Catherine Legg managed to squeeze through into the top 30, but Christian Lungard, Jack Harvey, and Graham Ray Hall all found themselves in the bottom four at the end of Saturday. Oh, and Stingray Rob, because why not, I guess? With the field capped at 33 cars for the race, one of them would be going home, and after a tight four battle, Graham Ray Hall would just miss out after his teammate Jack Harvey pipped into 33rd on the last run of the day. As Graham had a mental breakdown, we can turn our attention to the front of the field, where Rosenquist, Ferrucci, VK, Polo, Dixon and O'Ward had qualified for the fast six shootout to decide the front two rows of the grid. Chevy Power very nearly prevailed here, but in the end, it was the Chip Ganassi Honda of Alex Pillow who took pole position, setting the second fastest four lap average in Indy 500 history. It was also the closest front row we'd ever seen, just 0.1 of a mile an hour splitting the top three. With plenty now for the stat men to fornicate over, we can finally start to talk about the race, right? Well, not quite, as apparently we need to practice even more before the green flag flies on Sunday. You may have noticed so far that no one has managed to do what we regularly see at Indy and bin their car at high speed into the wall. That was until Catherine Legg decided she wanted to be a sausage curb and break Stefan Wilson's vertebrae. Though Wilson was alright after the crash, his injuries prevented him from taking part in the 500. Given that the car qualifies rather than the driver, Dreyer and Reinbol could have put a Teletubby in that car for all that mattered. Instead, they went with Graham Rahal, though I'm still an advocate of Tinky Winky here. Anyway, now we can cover the race, right? Well, still, no, as it was time for the annual Indy 500 Pit Stop Challenge. People actually wanted me to cover this for some reason. Well, Scott Dixon would end up defeating Penske's Will Power in the finals, which, looking at his performances so far this year, might be the only thing he wins all season. Right, now we can talk about the race. And after your standard anthem and guns and rolling Roger Penske out of his care home to remind drivers that they needed to start their engines, Alex Pillow led the entire field to green. Well... 
almost the entire field. When the number 24 car realised it now had Graham Rahal in the driver's seat, it decided to have electrical issues, meaning he started two laps down and already out of contention. Now Indy is one of those races you don't actually want to lead until the final few laps. This didn't bother Rina's VK though, as he sailed past Pelot on lap 3 to take P1. All in all though, it had been a relatively drama-free start for the Indy 500, though the first issues would emerge on Scott Dixon's car. The Aussie suffering from massive vibrations, forcing him to stop early on, where allegedly his wife asked the team to keep that set of tyres so she could have a go later. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Action seemed confined to the pit lane in the early stages, Catherine Legg trying to one-up her incident from earlier in the week when she tried to send one of the mechanics to the Paralympics. Following this, the team retired the car for the sake of everybody else around the track. Returning to the battle at the front, Polo and VK would come into the pits, but the overcut seemed to be more powerful than expected, cycling Felix Rosenquist in the McLaren to the effective race lead by lap 69. Oh, grow up. Pato Ward would sling one up the inside of VK, making it a McLaren 1 2, as the Team America car of Ferrucci also began to stretch its muscles. The McLarens were beautifully managing what was miraculously a caution free race somehow. But don't forget, Stingray's in the field, so really it's just a matter of, ah, oh, see, look, there you go. Rob hit the barrier after accusing Graham Rahal of being a Jedi and using his force powers to push him into the wall. And it was about to get even more dicey in the pit lane, as VK got fed up with battling with Polo and decided to just spear him into the barrier. After the Ed Carpenter racing driver was penalised for the incident, both ended up at the back. This was great news for the McLaren boys of O'Ward and Rosenquist though they did have the Junkos car of Callum Eilot ahead on a different strategy come the restart. Well, I say that, Callum put up the defence of a dead badger. A bit like the one that's made it onto Santino Ferrucci's head these days. Back to the restart, and there was more drama further back. 2016 winner Alex Rossi claiming the FP1 Biggest Balls Award for going round the outside at Turn 2. And then we got a four-wide moment that somehow didn't end up with four cars in the catch fencing. Marcus Ericsson was trying to put himself in contention now, sizing up a move on Ferrucci as the race began to settle down for a bit. So, as we all looked to Devlin Di Francesco to bring out the next caution, we forgot that Roman Grosjean was also in the field. He got bored after 150 laps, binning his DHL Honda in the wall. By now, Ericsson and Newgarden had fought their way to the front, and this was where things began to get interesting. Newgarden immediately went on the attack, taking the lead from the Swede as we went back to green. Ferrucci, meanwhile, made up two positions around the outside of the first corner, the American looking to make his mark in the 500-mile race. Also looking to make his mark was Felix Rosenquist, except all of his impressions seemed to be into the safer barrier with 16 laps to go. Rosenquist would then spin back across the track and collect the right rear of Kyle Kirkwood, sending the Pink Auto Nation Honda cockpit first into the wall, whilst his tyre made an escape for freedom over the fence and into the crowd. Thankfully, all that hit was a Chevy in the parking lot, and the irony of Kirkwood driving a Honda-powered car aside, that dent was probably an improvement anyway. With IndyCar wanting the race to end under green, the red flag was brought out. And I would spare you guys the torture here, but too many of you asked for this, so here you go. When we resumed, it would be Ryan Hunter Ray leading the field, having not pitted before the red flag. This isn't Formula 1 though, and there's no such thing as a free pit stop under these conditions, so he would quickly hand the P1 battle back to O'Ward and Ericsson. But let's not count out Joseph Newgarden. He went from third to first as we went green in the bid to win his first Indy 500. Pato O'Ward rather wanted to do that as well, so much so he got a little too excited and turned his Indy car into a 200 mile an hour fidget spinner. Simon Pagano would get a taste of his own medicine when McLaughlin punted him from behind, whilst Canapino decided he'd seen enough for the day and fell asleep at the wheel. Here we go again. There was now just five laps to go. New Garden leading from Ericsson and Ferrucci is just like last year, we get a dramatic sprint to the hour for God's sake. Ray Hall, Carpenter and Andretti wouldn't even make it across the finish line, whilst Benjamin Peterson got jealous behind and thought he'd just have his own little accident for good measure. We were red flagged again, and this time there wasn't enough laps remaining to form up and go racing. Surely Marcus Ericsson then, who'd snatched the lead from Newgarden before the children fell out at the back, had won the race. But then we found out that IndyCar had made a surprise new signing in the form of Michael Massey, and that we were going to have a further twist in the tale here. It was decided that we would throw all the regular IndyCar rules out the window and go for a one-lap shootout to the flag. 
This is sounding rather familiar, isn't it? Newgarden was able to use this to his advantage, and though Ericsson was able to fend him off through Turn 1, the Penske driver was able to get back past down the straightaway and win his first Indy 500. What an incredible finish! though that's going to cause some controversy. Regardless, Newgarden wasn't going to complain. He threw himself into the crowd, which I thought was rather risky given what just went down. I mean, can you imagine Verstappen doing that after Abu Dhabi 2021? I'd imagine he'd find himself rather quickly getting shot by a deranged Hamilton cultist. For me, I'm neutral. As long as Santino Ferrucci doesn't win, I'm happy. So I absolutely love this, but a Penske winning in controversial circumstances at a track now owned by Roger Penske Look, don't shoot the messenger, I'm just setting up the fallout in the comments below. I would love to know what you thought on this one, so let me know down there, and while you're at it, I'd really appreciate a like on the video and you subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. We recently crossed 69,000 subscribers, so a huge thank you on that really crucial milestone. We're on the road to 100k now, so if you haven't subbed yet, I'd really appreciate you helping me out. So, remember a couple of years ago when we went to Nashville and basically it was mental? So it turns out IndyCar took one look at that and thought, what if we managed to make it even worse? Now I say that like I haven't enjoyed the two demolition derbies we've had at the Music City Grand Prix. Let's be honest, I say I don't get excitement out of a crash because it would make people angry at me and I tend to give them plenty more reasons to do that anyway. But as IndyCar returned to Detroit, even the drivers were complaining. It was too short, too tight, with even some claiming the winner on Sunday would be the last man standing. I'm writing this bit before the race has even got underway, but I think it'll be worth a comedy review regardless. Roll that intro. Now, of course, the IndyCar series last raced around Detroit back in 2019, when the track was a circuit Gilles Villeneuve ripoff and the world hadn't ended yet. The sport hasn't always raced around there, though. Back in the 80s and early 90s, the Detroit Grand Prix took place at the old F1 layout, which, as you'd expect, was the peak of safety. I'm obviously joking. That was Michael Andretti, pinning it into the back of a recovery truck, soon to be followed by Dennis Vitolo, who was clearly on his way to spec savers as well. IndyCar hasn't returned to the downtown street since, until now of course. The new nine-turn layout featuring in this year's event was short, tight and bumpy. Not ideal racing conditions when you have Devlin Di Francesco in the field. He, to the surprise of literally no one, was the first to bin it into the concrete barriers during practice, with several other drivers out there getting a tad too close to the walls as well. With more red flags than Grosjean has had crashes this season, the situation didn't paint a brilliant picture ahead of the race on Sunday. At least we had a dry run in the form of the Indy Next series to put our minds at ease. Heading into this 35 mile an hour zone around. and Foster gets turned around from behind! Well shit. Full of confidence, the drivers headed out into qualifying. Well, I'd say that Christian Lungard headed straight into the concrete wall. Colton Herter would bitch slap the barrier on exit 2, as Kyle Kirkwood ripped his front left corner apart at turn 7. It would be Indy 500 pole winner Alex Pelot, though, who kept his number 10 Ganassi out the wall long enough to take back-to-back -back P1s in qualifying. Scotty Mack would join the Spaniard on the front row, with Grosjean and Dixon in hot pursuit coming into Sunday. Before we get into that, though, it's time for me to talk about the sponsor of this video. Me, since no one else wanted to this week. On a serious note, a big thank you for all the support for this series, and especially to those who help support me as a patron or channel member as well. If you want to get involved, head to the link in the description below. Now, race time. With the first start called off as America's best failed to get into formation, the real Grand Prix of Detroit got underway on lap two and lasted all of 100 metres. Callum Eilat's Junko's car attempted to mate with Carl Kirkwood's before we even got to the first turn. That brought out the yellows as the Andretti limped back to the pits for reconstructive surgery on its asshole. We tried to go racing again on lap 7, Pelo holding the lead as Grosjean slipped down the inside of McLaughlin. Start the clock as we await our next incident. Oh, hold on, we didn't get one. All the hype, all the concern, and even with Santina Ferrucci in the field, we were racing cleanly in Detroit. Well, for now at least. In the meantime, Grosjean was showing some impressive pace, meaning it was time for him to throw it all the way. That relinquished McLaughlin, but only for a matter of laps, as Dixon was now on a charge. You know who wasn't? Patero Ward. He had parked it in the middle of the pit lane for some reason. As it turns out, wheel guns aren't particularly useful when they don't have a wheel nut to put on. 
O'Ward found this out the hard way, but fair play to the Mexican for going back out and fighting to get back on the lead lap. When he realised all hope was lost, he did the slightly bored on look as a favour and brought out a caution for us all. Thank you, Pato. We went back racing again with 50 laps still to run and a lap for Rucci holding up the entire field. As he was jostled aside like a rogue ping pong ball, the yellow flags came out once again, this time for good old Stingray Rob. Now, how the hell did he manage to get stuck down there? Clearly wanting another caution, the AMR safety crew decided to restart the 51 and send Stingray on his merry way. As the strategists factored this into their pit stop plans, we were racing once again. Or actually, no, we weren't. Graham Rahal's dementia kicked in as he slammed the 15 car into the wall under caution. As he phoned Catherine Legg to see if she could break someone else's back, Benjamin Peterson proved that dementia is in fact an airborne disease. Now, this is what we were expecting from good old Detroit, isn't it? We would actually go green again on lap 56, with Will Power, who'd cycled up to the front thanks to gambling on strategy, storming past Palo on the faster alternate tyre. Fun fact about those alternate tyres this weekend, you may have noticed that they were green instead of the usual red. That's because they were made out of more sustainable materials, and were thus more environmentally friendly. And so, like all environmentally friendly replacements, they were all a piece of shit. With Pillow back in the lead and power sinking like the Belgrano, Scott Dixon took a risk pitting early and trying to go till the end of the race. That didn't seem to be the goal for the remaining McLarens in the field, Rossi and Rosenquist playing a high-speed version of carbon fiber chicken. You know who else was together on track? Rojan and McLaughlin which, as we know, only ends in one massive fiery accident. Once again, it was Grosjean who was leaving the pits, and not wanting a St. Pete rerun, chose to bin McLaughlin into the apex of T1 before the Chevy driver even had a chance. Karma was about to bite Grosjean back, though. As it turned out, he didn't need McLaughlin to bin him into the wall. The Frenchman was, in fact, quite capable of doing that himself. With Roman exploding in a fit of rage not making that joke, we tried to go racing again, though David Malukas put his car in the wall before that even happened. I'm sure you're expecting a joke for this one, but, um, moving on. That left us with a 10-lap sprint to the flag, and with power having got off the vegan tyres, he was good again. Vegan rubber or not, to punt up the rear end by Scott Dixon isn't going to help your cause. That benefited Alex Rossi, the McLaren man sailing through the carnage from 5th to 2nd, Wonder if there's a reason I'm mentioning that for later on. In the meantime, we had another caution, and nay, it's Stingray again. Five laps to go then, yet Rossi seemed to think he was on a formation lap. He slipped behind power and got in another amazing battle with his teammate. It was great, clean racing. Until it wasn't. McLaren were imploding, but really, there was no stopping Alex Polo and Ganassi out front. He came across the line to take what was really a dominant victory, with power and a pre-castrated Rosenquist rounding out the podium. You know, for a moment there, I thought all the hype around this race was going to be for nothing. Then Stingray Rob happened, and we got another classic here in 2023. Polo really has his sights set on the title now, and it's going to take some doing to challenge him. That being said, this is IndyCar, and momentum can start and stop in just a mere few seconds. I mean, just ask Roman Grosjean. Indy takes a break next week before heading to Road America at the exact same time as the Canadian Grand Prix. Cheers for that one, guys. You can rest assured, though, that both will get a video regardless. So if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of that. So IndyCar's return to Detroit may have been a bit of a mess, but round eight of the 2023 season, we see the sport head to Road America, which is slightly more forgiving. Well, unless your name starts with Roman and ends in Grosjean. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and Michael Andretti's worst nightmare. Let's get into the comedy review of the Sonsio Grand Prix of Road America. Now we have a lot of on and off track action to dive into this weekend, but as usual we have the news segment first and this one gets pretty juicy. The big headline coming into the race lie with Ed Carpenter Racing and Connor Daly. The American was one of the most popular drivers on the grid this year. Was. Connor ended up going through what I like to call the Daniel Ricciardo effect, whereby you can be perceived as the next coming of Christ all you want by the fans when you have an average finishing position of 17th, 
you're not keeping your drive. Sure enough, Daly's P15 at Detroit was the last straw, with the team showing him the door and finding a replacement in the form of 2012 series champion Ryan Hunter Ray. Captain America made a one-off return to the championship back at the Indy 500, claiming then that he actually enjoyed spending more time with his family post-retirement. Claims that when we look back on them now, seem to be complete and utter bollocks. Coming in mid-season was definitely going to be a challenge though, made all the more difficult by a completely resurfaced track and the existence of Stingray Rob. Road America's new look meant drivers approached first practice with a bit of caution, something that if you've been watching IndyCar for any length of time, they don't really know how to do. We had several close scares, Colton Herta revealing he was pro-violence against advertising boards before championship leader Alex Pelot became the first to find the wall. One of his main rivals, Will Power, wasn't having the best of sessions either, and by that, it turned into a complete and utter clusterfuck. First to piss him off was Roman Grosjean, who revealed that he was clinically blind when he almost pushed the Penske driver into the barriers. Funnily enough, this didn't make power best pleased, later on claiming Grosjean could do with a quote, punch in the face. Rumour now has it that the pair will show up on the KSI Misfits boxing card in December. Things were about to get even worse when poor Will found Scott Dixon. The Kiwi had also turned senile as he drifted across the track and wiped both men out of second practice. As Power politely told Dixon what he thought of the crash, guess what that brought out? <laughs> we'll return to the tumultuous tale of Will Power later. First, we've got yet another red flag to get out of the way. And what a surprise, it's Santino Ferrucci. We'd get going again, only for her to lose it and bring out another one. Okay, can we just breathe for a minute? Ah, oh, for fuck. <laughs> to save us all, I'm just going to move on to qualifying, where Hunter Ray picked up where Daly left off, hitting the barrier and bringing out another red, failing to progress out of round one. Roman Grosjean's day wasn't getting much better either, looping it around in the opening minutes of qualifying, and I'd just like to thank Will Power for sponsoring just this part of the video. The Australian wasn't having it much better though, as he took his number 12 Penske on a lawn mowing trip through the grass and out of qualifying. Scott Dixon became the other shot round one exit, and would end up starting the race right alongside his newest best friend. That at least will be entertaining. As we moved into round two, the Andretti cars seemed to decide that they'd had enough. Colton Herta narrowly dodged an early exit when he turned the Gamebridge Honda into a spinning top, and that was followed by Carl Kirkwood's car going for a smoke and retiring for the day. Devlin Di Francesco would also fail to make it into the final session, but that's just because he was Devlin Di Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably one of his best results, and I'm still taking the piss. Anyway, Herta, despite his spin, would survive, and ended up taking pole position for the race on Sunday. He would line up alongside O'Ward on the front row, with Below and Ugarden in hot pursuit behind. And that brings us to the race, which, as I'm sure you know, had to go on at the exact same time as the Canadian Grand Prix. Hats off to the boffin who scheduled that into the calendar. Anyway, Herta would make a good start, as Below and O'Ward got dicey for second. The Mexican's day was about to get even worse as Kirkwood used him as a break into T1 and was thus sent spinning out and bringing out our first caution of the day. Before that came out, there was a bit more drama further back. Benjamin Peterson had had a decent qualifying effort for once, though Jack Harvey was able to rectify this and send the Dutchman back to where he belongs. The other yellow would also bring some cars into the pits, meaning Herta would take the restart ahead of Pelot and Armstrong who I've just remembered exists in this championship. As the Kiwi attempted to get past his experienced teammate into Turn 1, Grosjean continued to incense Will Power as he forced the Australian out wide and into the clutches of Dixon. Karma wasn't far around the corner though, with Power getting a front row view as Grosjean had his standard Grosjean moment on lap 12. This incident must have really upset Scott McLaughlin. With no one to crash into now, he decided to just take his anger out on Santino Ferrucci. Given his history, I can't say I'm a complaint about this one. With the yellow out for Roman, Herta chose to come into the pits, along with pretty much half of the field. This would lead to chaos, though, as unsafe releases from VK and Armstrong held up Simon Pagano and Kyle Kirkwood. During this fracas, Kirkwood's engineers were overheard telling everyone to take their time, 
which I'm sure probably explains where their pace has been all year. Back to the on-track action, and we wouldn't be green for even a few seconds before Jack Harvey thought he'd found a clever shortcut straight into the parking lot. We'd try that racing thing again on lap 19, with Herta holding the lead still from Pelot and Newgarden. Marcus Ericsson, meanwhile, found himself overtaken by both Devlin Di Francesco and Santino Ferrucci, which is motorsport code for maybe it's time to pack up and retire. This clearly enraged the Swede, who did what we all do when we're angry, and took said anger out on the French. There was more drama on lap 23, as Newgarden made his way by Pelot like it was an iRacing open lobby. With those two squabbling, this was great news for Colton Herta. Andretti had had a pretty painful day, but maybe a win could just help ease that. I sure hope nothing goes wrong later. The Americans' lead would be reduced to naught after David Malukas ground to a standstill in the number 18 Honda. Things then got worse when a slow pit stop placed Colton behind Pelo and Newgarden. With Armstrong and Power deciding against fresh rubber, they led the field to green. With everyone having to navigate a lap, Jack Harvey, who seemed determined to bring out the pace car again for some reason. Miraculously, everyone came through this unscathed. Well, except for Devlin Di Francesco, but at least he's back where he's comfortable now. So Armstrong and Powell were in the lead, though they were really gambling on a caution at this stage to save their weekends. That was sound logic, given Stingray was still circling at the back though he decided to be well behaved for once in this one. As they boxed under green, Herter had managed to cycle his way back to the front. How, you ask? Well, blame the Canadian Grand Prix because I have no bloody idea. Not that it matters, as he and Andretti were about to throw all this away with an early pit stop. Herter got a nice undercut here, but now he had to manage his fuel all the way to the flag. While we talk about managing, let's just spare a moment for all the Grosjean fans out there who were trying their best not to kill themselves as they watched the Phoenix go for a nest in the Road America runoff. Back at the front, Andretti's nightmare was reaching its conclusion. Herta was a sitting duck as Pelot soared past and into the lead. That one extra lap making the difference as Colton tried to limp to the finish on fumes. Herta would spend the remaining laps dropping even further back as Stingray finally remembered his place and that it was time to have his traditional accident. Though for Stingray standards, I'm only branding this a 2 out of 10. No caution, I'm afraid, brings this one down a little. As usual, though, there was no such troubles for Alex Pelot. He came across the line to secure yet another win in 2023 and further extend his championship lead to 74 points. We're getting this again, aren't we? Marcus Armstrong did at least try to make the sport a little bit more interesting when he tried to wipe out his teammate on the final lap. I imagine the rage of Kingpin here, though, just wasn't worth it. But to think that this is the seat Alex was trying so desperately to get out of last season, what a difference a year makes, eh? As for Andretti, well, this was a weekend to forget. From strategy blunders on Herter's car, throwing away what really should have been their first win on the year, to Grosjean just being... well, whatever that was. It's really turning into a dire year for the Frenchman. Anyway, that's my thoughts on the Grand Prix of Road America. We're off to mid-Ohio next, but you can of course expect plenty of content from me before then. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a minute of it. Now, I'll be honest, I usually kick off these reviews with a dig at the venue we're racing at, but when it comes to mid-Ohio, I literally know nothing about it. So I gave it a Google then, and the top result described the place as, quote, almost heaven. I guess that's why Pagano tried to make the trip early. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the comedy review as IndyCar headed to mid-Ohio for the ninth round of the season. We're at the halfway point in the year now, a year that frankly has been dominated by Alex Pelot and Ganassi. You could say IndyCar and F1 mirror themselves a lot nowadays, except we haven't got bored of the once great team looking like imbeciles yet and the fact that unlike Formula 1, IndyCar is actually good. Just like Simon Pagano, there's plenty to sink our nose cones into today. So let's get into the comedy review of the Honda Indy 2000 at Mid-Ohio presented by the 2023 Accord Hybrid Grand Prix. News time then, and first off we have to revisit Colton Herter, who's finally decided that he wants to be quick again, it's just that his strategists haven't quite woken up yet. Following the last race at Road America, Andretti Autosport decided to make further reshuffles in that exact apartment. As a result, Herter would receive his third strategist on the year, in the form of Devlin Di Francesco's usual race caller, Rob Edwards probably because there's not much use Devlin having one. There were further personnel changes down the grid, as McLaren announced the signing of IndyCar legend Tony Kanaan as a new advisor. 
and nobody seemed to care. We'll get into practice then, the first of which saw absolutely nothing happen, so I'll tell you that Patero Ward topped it to move on to what you actually want my thoughts on. Practice 2, and Simon Pagano decided it was time to trade in IndyCar for gymnastics. Now I get the French have been a little bit angry recently, but there's a time and a place, Simon. The crash saw Pagano withdraw from the rest of the weekend, leaving Maya Shank Racing with a seat free for the race on Sunday. If only there was a recently sacked IndyCar driver floating around the paddock. Oh look, it's Connor Daly. The fan favourite American was back in an IndyCar, though due to the lateness of his entry, didn't have time to qualify. That's okay though, I think he's quite used to starting at the back anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. We may as well talk about quali, and having been a front runner in practice, Pato Ward seemed like a strong candidate for pole. He goes around! Never mind. With Pato and later McLaren teammate Alexander Rossi failing to make it through round one, some of the drivers further down the grid were beginning to poke their heads up in interest. That definitely applied to the Ray Hall Lesman Lanigan cars, in particular Graham Ray Hall. The American grew up around mid Ohio and looked set to take a shock pole at the end of qualifying only to be pipped by Colton in the dying seconds, though now it's just a case of waiting till the strategists fill up his car with vodka or something. In all seriousness though, with Colton's new strategy team already flexing their muscles, could this just be redemption for their mistakes at Road America? We'll come back to that, shall we? Let's instead dive into the race then. Herter making a great start, Ross Ray Hall came back to his senses and decided it was time to be slow again. With the field now checked up, it was time to sit back, relax and wait for the inevitable accident. And this time, it would be the pair of Swedes coming to blows, Marcus Ericsson pole vaulting Felix Rosenquist. With Rosenquist's McLaren trying out blackface and the AMR safety crew sending Ericsson on his way with broken suspension, everyone else was gearing up for a restart, where it appeared as if Graham Rahal had actually woken up as he began challenging for the lead. Another driver having a much better weekend was Kyle Kirkwood, until he met Alex Palou, that was. On the bright side, at least Andretti still had a car in the lead. Then again, they also did at Road America, and look how that turned out. Well, Herter would pit on lap 28, leaving Ray Hall to cruise around the front, looking for his retirement home. Now I say that, it was surprisingly close when Graham pitted one lap later. Though, with the aid of warm tyres, Herter was able to move on by. That seemed to imply, though, that the overcut was a viable strategy. And that's exactly what Alex Palou decided to do jumping both Herter and Ray Hall when he emerged from pit road on lap 30. Now before you switch off, assuming Alex will cruise to a sure victory, let's just remember that this is an 80 lap race, and that Herter is very much still in this fight if he doesn't mess up on strategy like he did at Road America. Have you sensed the sarcasm yet? In fact, strategy would have nothing to do with Colton's most recent downfall. This time, the only blame can be appointed to himself. As the American dived into the pits for a second time, he found himself breaking the speed limit. Now, unlike Formula 1, IndyCar tend to award their penalties a bit quicker than four hours after the bloody race. As a result, Colton received a drive through wrecking any chances of victory. All eyes then turned to Graham Rahal. Maybe he could turn his fortunes around with a historic win on home soil. Or maybe his pit crew would suddenly suffer from dementia instead. With Pelot now uncontested for the victory, there was still some drama further back, mainly with Roman Grosjean and Devlin Di Francesco, who miraculously hadn't crashed yet. That's not like they weren't trying to, however, as the pair dies for P12 like it was a world championship in the closing stages. It was a remarkably quiet and clean race for IndyCar standards. I've not even had to mention Stingray Rob's name all day. Benjamin Peterson, on the other hand, yeah, let's get to that. The Danish driver, yes, I got that right this week, woke up on Sunday and decided he was going to be an asshole for the afternoon. He found himself in his typical position of being lapped by drivers who are actually competent, except chose that he didn't want this to happen. Now, to be clear on the IndyCar rules, we don't see blue flags like we do in Formula 1. Well, not unless they've been lapped once already anyway. Peterson was still on the lead lap, so could technically defend all he liked. Though, this is one of those unwritten rules between drivers that you, well, just don't. Clearly though, someone had kidnapped Benjamin's entire family and threatened to shoot them periodically in the head every time he let a car through. This continued through the latter stages of the race, though it never impacted Alex Pelot the Ganassi driver coming to the flag to take his fourth victory in five races and extend his championship lead into triple digits. Meanwhile, Scotty Mack went over to have a very polite word with Peterson. Besides his antics, the drivers seemed like they were a little better behaved out there this time round, though we still got plenty of action and some great battling throughout the race. Quite frankly, Mid-Ohio was exactly that. 
mid. But that's just a testament to how great the rest of the season has been so far. Now I know it was a bit of a shorter one this week, but I really hope you enjoyed the comedy review regardless. So don't forget to drop it a like if you did, and get subscribed for more in the future. I'm trying to get a video out to you guys every single Sunday this year, so be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss out on a single upload. Now, you'd think that with no Max Verstappen cakewalk to cover this weekend, I'd actually be able to turn my attention solely to the latest IndyCar round at Toronto. However, I was too busy dodging stray wheels at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Not that I'm complaining, of course, it was an incredible event. That said, if you were meant to go on the Saturday... <laughs> Anyway, these videos are for my majority American audience anyway, so you probably don't even know what I'm going on about. Let's then go on to what you're actually here for. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1, and the comedy review of when IndyCar tried out Car Parking Simulator. Round 10 of the series would see the sport take its only dip away from the United States and head to Toronto. And if you're confused by that statement, thinking, but didn't we go to St. Petersburg for round one? Do us all a favor and grow a f***ing brain. As for the news, only one story dominated the headlines this week. That being the appointment of British IMSA champion Tom Blomquist at Maya Shank Racing. Simon Pagano was still too busy being French after his roly-poly at Mid-Ohio the other week. And since the team couldn't deal with another weekend of Connor Daly, they invited Blomquist here to have a go. It was a pretty quiet news week and practice one would kinda go the same way. Andretti's Carl Kirkwood would top a session that didn't really see a whole lot happen. Thankfully, some rain would show up for practice two and finally wake all of us up. Christian Lungard was the first to clout the wall, getting away with damage by the finest of margins. Jack Harvey would slightly one-up this attempt before Felix Rosenquist took the game of chicken too far and slammed his McLaren into the wall. Despite the treacherous weather, that was our biggest accident of the day, though we came close to a much bigger one when Joseph Newgarden came across a group of cars that I can only assume were on low power mode or something. It would be Colton Herter who topped P2, giving Andretti some positive signs heading into qualifying. Positives that given the calamities and cock-ups that have befallen them recently, they desperately need at the moment. Quali would roll around then and the first big name to fall would be the championship leader Alex Pelot. The Spaniard failed to make it through the first round as the entire IndyCar paddock broke into song at the prospect of someone else winning the race on Sunday for once. Who knew then that that song would turn out to be a bit of a rain dance as by the time Group 2 were about to hit the track, it had gone from this to this. That might just have been good news for newbie Tom Blomquist, and for a while it looked as if he may just make it into the Fast 12. Oh, and he's under the tires! Okay, that probably didn't help. In fairness, he wasn't the only one making mistakes out there. Graham Rahal was back to his usual self when he nosed his car into the wall, and feeling left out, Roman Grosjean thought he'd have a go as well. As for practice two pace sitter Colton Herter, he would also fail to progress. So much for those positive signs I mentioned earlier. The weather had cleared up as the Fast 12 got underway, and even with Roman still trundling around at the back, everyone was still fairly well behaved. Will Power got into his first Fast 6 of 2023, and the other surprise happened to be the number 45 of Christian Lungard, though many just expected him to make it a five-way fight for pole and the Fast 6. The Danish driver didn't seem to get that memo, however, crossing the line to take what I thought was his first pole on the year, completely forgetting he'd done the same thing at Indy a few months back. Lungard slipped to P4 that day, though would he be able to do better around the streets of Toronto? Well, after lap one, he was doing better than most of the field, I'll tell you that. The Dane had an electric start off the line as Scott McLaughlin tried to hold off the McLaren of O'Ward in third. What you might notice, though, as the cars go through your picture, is two things. Firstly, that Stingray Rob and Devlin Francesco are already miles behind the pack, and that the field looks rather small for some reason. That's because the rest of them were busy parked up for the day. Ryan Hunter Ray was picking up from where Connor Daly left off as he squeezed the 30 of Jack Harvey into the wall. That caused all hell to break loose behind as Tom Blomquist's first start in IndyCar now rivaled that of Nikita Mazepin. And Benjamin Peterson was also forced into early retirement, though after his antics last time out, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who actually cared. Graham Rahal was also stuck in this traffic jam, though used his extensive knowledge of the Toronto back alleys to keep himself on the lead lap. Turns out, Graham performing like a taxi driver all year 
does have its benefits. The race would restart on lap 10, with Lungard catching McLaughlin napping for the second time today. As he managed the gap out front, Roman Grosjean and Alex Pelot were handing us all the entertainment we needed. Shuffling past the other Ganassi of Armstrong, as Alex decided to not bother passing Grosjean in front, given that he just had to wait a few laps until the Frenchman threw himself into the wall again. By lap 30, Pelot had got impatient of waiting and just dived down the inside anyway. The next man on this list being the Gamebridge Honda of Colton Herta. This led to Grosjean heading down to Pitt Road, prompting the IndyCar commentators to say, Probably be the only time we see him again. That wouldn't strictly be true though. We would see Roman one more time, as he forgot to turn at the final corner a few laps later. As the caution flags came out for the second time, strategy was well and truly being thrown up into the air. Carl Kirkwood could have done with a few more laps under yellow to make his work before he came to the epiphany that he could just cause this yellow himself. With Castro Neves facing the wrong way, then blocking the track even more when he tried to get going again, the pace car was back out on circuit. Most of the field now headed to pit road, including leader Lungard, as Scott McLaughlin took over the P1 spot by staying out though would need Stingray Rob to do Stingray Rob things if he wanted to stay there. Karma would then come around for Kirkwood on the restart as he was swamped by a fast starting Pelot and Herta. IndyCar then achieved the impossible by going three wide and not ending up like this again. Kirkwood's master plan would come to an end when the stewards handed him a penalty and took him out of contention. He then didn't serve that penalty correctly and got another one. I'll be honest, at this point, I was surprised he didn't just straight line it into the Prince's gate. Anyway, and going back to those who might actually challenge for the lead, and Alex Pelot, despite his poor starting position, was looking pretty good. The same couldn't be said for his front wing, however, which was hanging on for dear life for the final 30 laps of the race. Meanwhile, race leader McLaughlin was still waiting for Stingray to do Stingray things and give him the caution he needed to stay in the fight for the win. When this didn't happen, he was forced into the pits under green, Strategy not working out for him this time, though you can see why he gave it a go. As the real race lead changed hands, so was the effective one. Christian Lungard muscling his way past Pelot and his wonky front wing to set himself up for a debut win in IndyCar. And as Dixon came in for new tyres, that was starting to look like a real possibility. Now it just came down to whether those who pitted under the last caution could hang on with fuel and whether Pelot's front wing could hang on to his Ganassi car. It didn't seem like an issue until Ericsson and Power were forced into the pits on the final lap. The teams worried they'd run dry and not make it to the checkered flag. Christian Lungard, however, on the same strategy, opted to stay out. He was 1.8 miles away from his first win in IndyCar, though if he ran out of gas, it would be all for nothing. Not to mention how much of a tit he would look as well. That said, after 85 tours of the Toronto circuit, Lungard crossed the line. He'd done it. Pelot and Herta would round out the podium in what was a thoroughly entertaining race. From strategy drama to car parks, this one had it all. The championship picture is one, let's be honest, we don't care about at this stage, but fair play to Pelot for fighting back to second and showing us all why he deserves that trophy at the end of the year. As for Lungard, he seems to think this is only the start, and after a commanding performance like that, you'd struggle to disagree with him. I just wonder now if a few of the top teams may be keeping a watchful eye on the Dane for the rest of the season. Anyway, if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to let me know by dropping it a like, subscribing to the channel for more, and telling me what you thought of the race down in the comments section. Round 11 and 12 of the IndyCar season would both take place at the Iowa Speedway, the shortest circuit on the IndyCar calendar, meaning lots of laps and thus lots of opportunities to watch Stingray Rob stick it in the wall. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that gets released almost before the race is over. Actually, that's a bad one to use when I'm three days late, isn't it? Anyway, we have not one, but two races to cover this time round, so let's not waste any more time and roll that intro. Starting as usual with the news, and I can't lie, there really wasn't a lot going on into this week's doubleheader. Connor Daly was back again, still subbing in for Simon Pagano, though people seem to care even less than they did last time, and Delara rolled out a new wheel hub update to prevent a repeat of Carl Kirkwood's crash at the Indy 500 in May. Really bad weekend to announce that as it turned out. We'll get into Stingray's three-wheeled antics a little later. 
For now, we've got first practice to dissect, and straight away, the Andretti drivers were causing trouble. Roman Grosjean was clearly fed up of crashing all the time after Toronto, and so tried to balance the books by killing Herta early into the session. Devlin DiFrancesco was also causing problems, driving so slowly he nearly caused a bigger accident behind with Ryan hunter Ray and Marcus Ericsson. Then it turned out this was just Devlin driving at full racing speed. We'll give the Andrettis a break as Augustine Canapino just caught my attention. And as a Brit, I would be doing my country a disservice if I didn't rip into the Argentinians for a bit. Canapino has been rather quiet of late, though got some TV time when he spun exiting the pit lane of all things. Despite this, the AMR safety team still thought he was safe enough to restart and unleash back onto the racetrack. Practice ended with Grosjean again, as the DHL Honda nearly used championship leader Alex Palo as a takeoff strip before sending Ferrucci high towards the wall. Though, given this was Santino, he probably deserved it. It was Oval Master Joseph Newgarden on top heading into qualifying, with Penske looking quick across the board. With this being a double header, quality would work a little differently to normal. With drivers setting two consecutive laps, their average speed on the first setting the grid for race one and the second for race two. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, the weather clearly had other ideas, and with IndyCar drivers afraid of getting a little bit wet, we were stuck in a long delay before we could set the grid for Saturday and Sunday. Eventually, we were able to get going, with friend of the channel, David Malukas, the first to make an impression. So-called Little Dave may need to change his name to Big Dave now, in reference to how big his balls had to be to keep his foot down as the car stepped out on the opening lap. That first tour was so good, he broke the IndyCar scoreboard, but for race two, it was good enough to provisionally go to the top. You see, I can be nice to these guys. All it takes is a Twitter follow, apparently. Stingray, that's all you have to do. Malukas' times would remain in the top half of the table, though were eventually trumped by the Andrettis and Penske's. Then Will Power had a go, and clearly he'd seen the new Oppenheimer film as he proceeded to nuke the opposition. Power would thus take pole for both races at Iowa, but would he be able to convert either into a win? Well, let's find out. Race 1 went green, despite the field being about as organised as the government over here in the UK at the moment. Regardless, Power held the lead from Penske teammate Scott McLaughlin. Further back, Hunter Ray finally remembered what sport he was coming back to as he went four wide on the opening lap, the exchange somehow not resulting in a plane crash. But as the Penske drivers soared away in an early 1-2-3, the initial battles were between the Ganassi of Dixon and the McLaren of Pato Ward. While they were scrapping, the leaders were already finding the chumps competing for participation awards at the rear. Basically, this race was turning into the real-life equivalent of Baby Park. Despite weaving through the slow traffic, the top three were being fairly well-behaved at this stage. That would all change after the first round of stops, however. Joseph Newgarden deciding he didn't like being third anymore and challenging for the lead. There was a close call as McLaughlin mistook the number two car for Roman Grosjean and thus tried to ram him off the track, though by the time IndyCar had shown a replay of the pass, Newgarden was lining up an overtake on his other teammate, Will Power, for P1. Power held him off initially, but on lap 121, Joseph made it by and from there, the battle for the lead was pretty much done. It was quite an unusual IndyCar race, made even more strange by the fact that by half distance, we hadn't seen a single caution period. When the yellows did fly, however, there was no surprise in guessing who it was. Graham Rahal saying hi to the fans in the grandstand as his race came to an end. We get going again on lap 166, as Power's day got worse, being swamped at the restart. Pato Award also attempted a move for second, though eventually backed out of the pass on McLaughlin. Hey, at least he's learned from Indy. We'll take a quick break from the leaders to check in on Dumb and Dumber, or should I say DeFrancesco and Peterson. The pair clashed in the pit lane where Peterson's pit crew were exposed as legally blind. On the bright side, I don't think it's possible for the paddock to hate the man anymore after mid-Ohio. There were no such worries for Joseph Newgarden, however. The Hitachi Chevy cruised to a victory that once he had the lead, never really looked in doubt. Now, you'd assume Joseph would be pretty happy with that result, though you'd be wrong. In fact, he was rather pissed off about it. The source of the American's frustrations had been with the lap cars he'd had to overtake on his way to the win. Newgarden was so incensed, he threatened to, quote, fence them if they did it again. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think you can sell them, Joseph. That joke was not only bad, most people probably didn't get it either. On the bright side, thank God for New Garden's sake, the IndyCar field is 100% white. Moving on, and Sunday would bring about race two, with a special guest in the form of Ed Sheeran to start the race. He had been told he had to copy the starter from the day before, 
so something Sheeran's quite good at already. Power made another decent start ahead of McLaughlin and Malukas. Meanwhile, Patuo Ward was getting his act together early, running side by side with Newgarden, before the pair formed a temporary truce to soar by Ed Carpenter. Newgarden then left O Ward in the dust to chase after his teammates, who, like Race 1, were battling for the lead. Joseph turned down the afterburners and made a double overtake for P1 I can't write a joke about because it was just too f***ing awesome. Now he only had one caution in race one, though Augustine Canapino was quick to equal that tally when he slammed his Junko's car into the wall on lap 88. They say cautions breed cautions, but in this instance it was Stingray Rob breeding tyres. As I said at the start, what a weekend for Dallara to unveil their new hub design, eh? Admittedly, this wasn't their fault. Just whoever it was at Delcoin Racing who thought Stingray would be any quicker as a tricycle out there. We can add them to the idiot bin next to the one who hired Stingray in the first place. <laughs> Sorry, no, that was too harsh. Either way for IndyCar, this was no laughing matter. They disqualified the 51, and can I just say, thank God no one was hit by that wheel and turned this race into a Rocket League tournament. With Stingray out and thus the field feeling much safer, we went green on lap 168. With lap runners in the way, Newgarden was free to control the restart. As cars went four wide further back and we were treated to some fantastic racing. Joseph looked set to make it two for two then. Except Felix Rosenquist and McLaren didn't seem to get that memo and out of nowhere started to put the pressure on. And just as Newgarden looked like he'd got the situation under control, the yellows were out again. This time for Ryan Hunter Ray, who decided he just couldn't be bothered with the last 10 laps of the race. We went green with just four tours left to go, and immediately Rosenquist went from hero to zero as he got wide and let the whole field past him. That left Will Power and Alex Pillow as the only two who could challenge Newgarden out front. Though, after another 250 laps of the Iowa circuit, Joseph hung on and made it a clean sweep of the weekend. Overall then, a pretty fun few days of racing, where we had less of drivers slamming themselves into the barriers and more of the good, close, wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing we expect from IndyCar. And then Stingray Rob, of course, though at least he gave me some material to work with this weekend. If you enjoyed this doubleheader comedy review though, make sure you get subscribed to the channel for more in the future. Next up, it's the third running of the Music City Grand Prix. And if you know my history, then you'll know I'm already hyped for that one. Now, at the start of the year, before I decide to cover the entire IndyCar season and thus document the slow death of Benjamin Peterson's career, I'll admit I only plan to cover two races, that being the Indy 500, for obvious reasons, and the Music City Grand Prix, because it's always a complete and utter disaster. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1, and the Comedy Review, the series that, uh, yeah, I'm not reading that one out. Anyway, the weekend just gone would see IndyCar return to Nashville for the third and final time on this layout, and after a fairly subdued start, delivered with crashes, threesomes, and a race that was won by just 0.7 of a second. We'll of course get to all of that, but first, roll the intro. Right then, let's start as we usually do with the news, and as I mentioned in the intro, we got confirmation this week that the Nashville circuit would see a significant redesign ahead of the next running of the race in 2024, along with the reveal that it would now be the season finale for IndyCar going forward. I'll be honest and admit that I'm actually a little sad about that news, knowing that we're going to lose a layout that's provided 17 cautions in just two runnings so far, though the drivers and genuinely people who know a lot more about track design than me seem to like the new layout, so I think I'll just shut up for once. Besides, the changes were inevitable anyway, with the Tennessee Titans building a new stadium that would engulf the existing paddock complex. Now, I'll probably lose a lot of subscribers over this, but I'm a Jags fan, so I'll take any new reasons to hate on division rivals. Also in the news, we got yet another new replacement for Simon Pagano at Meyer Shank Racing this weekend, this time in the form of Indy Lights champion Linus Lundqvist. And first off, why does he look like a Swedish Nikita Mazepin? Thankfully, Tech Tips here is very different to our Lord and Saviour on this channel. In two ways, actually. One, he's not a complete asshole, And two, he actually seems to have some pace. This was shown throughout the practice sessions, floating in and around the top 10 before the heavens opened and made his IndyCar debut weekend a little bit more difficult. Despite the weather, the opening sessions of the weekend were a little more subdued compared to normal. Will Power would top practice one before remembering he hadn't hit anything yet and fix this before returning to the pits. Other than that, all we saw was drivers forgetting the new layout wasn't coming into effect until next year, 
Both were able to flick spin their way out of their mistakes, apart from Callum Eilot here, but we only ever see the Young Coast cars on TV when they have made an error. So fair play to him for milking the opportunity a bit. The poor weather would spill, quite literally, over to Saturday, with practice three cancelled and qualifying heavily delayed. On the bright side, here's a squirrel in a cowboy hat, because... America, I guess. When Quali finally got underway, Benjamin Peterson was quick to do what Benjamin Peterson does best and bring out the red flag. Augustine Canapino, meanwhile, was fastest through the pit lane and that was his day done. Tech Tips and Malukas, meanwhile, would put in stunning laps to get themselves into the Fast 12, with some big names failing to make the cut. Armstrong, Ericsson and even one of the Andrettis. No, wait, that's just Di Francesco, never mind. More shocks would come in round two, as last year's winner Scott Dixon brought out the Reds with just 20 seconds to go. Everyone else would be allowed one final lap to improve their run, but no one did, leading us into the fast six, and for Scott McLaughlin to tune into his inner Max Verstappen as he dominated and secured pole by almost a full second. O'Ward would make up the rest of the front row, with Herter and championship leader Alex Palou behind as we got our caution counters ready for the race on Sunday. That would bring with it sunny skies, and mass panic if your name's Will. Wait, hang on. Will Power nearly didn't start the race entirely when his earbuds mysteriously went missing prior to the green flag. They turned up in the nick of time, and it's days like these where we could be thankful that the Drive to Survive weirdos haven't found IndyCar yet. Stealing drivers' earbuds and flogging them on eBay sounds right up their alley. When the field actually went green, McLaughlin held the lead, as Herter and Malukas made places, and the field welcomed Linus Lundquist to IndyCar by battering him out of the way like a rag doll. Rather strangely, the early phases of the race turned out to be quite clean, Graham Rahal was struggling, but that was no real surprise. Meanwhile, Joseph Newgarden was doing a fantastic job defending his late championship comeback. The first yellow would fly on lap 12, when David Malukas' rear wing decided it wanted to be on someone else's IndyCar and made a bid for freedom. I'd make another joke here, but honestly, David's own assessment on Twitter does better than I could ever do. Back to the action, and we'd go racing again on lap 16. Except no one told Colton Hurt of that, he was still in Sunday drive mode as he plummeted down the order. Cautions usually breed more cautions in Nashville, though not in this instance. That said, Carl Kirkwood nearly gave birth to a second when he auditioned for Formula Drift in a suicide attempt on lap 32. He would soon inherit the lead from McLaughlin and Grosjean, who were in their usual death grip in the battle for second. Come lap 46, I was starting to double check that we were still racing in the Music City. No yellows for 30 laps must have been some sort of record, and that would continue despite Devlin De Francesco's best efforts. The green running was actually creating a different problem marbles, which were accumulating by the side of the track and turning it into a bit of an ice rink. That might have been the issue for Romain Grosjean, as he let McLaughlin by on lap 49. It could also be put down to just Romain Grosjean, though. Those two weren't the only ones getting feisty, as after an intimate moment with Alex Rossi, Renus VK decided he would just drive home for the rest of the day. That incident still wouldn't create a caution. In fact, we wouldn't see the second yellow until 10 laps from the end as Linus Tech Tip's incredible debut rounded out in the concrete barriers. At the same time, Jack Harvey decided he'd remind us that he was still racing an IndyCar, and he throwed himself into the wall as well, meaning the pace car was out once again. We get going with seven laps left to run, Kirkwood leading from McLaughlin and Pelot. The Andretti made an excellent breakaway from the chasing pack, only for that to be ruined by three cars deciding to have a threesome halfway around the lap and shock horror if it isn't Benjamin Peterson again. Rosenquist was the first to hit the wall, with Canapino and Peterson joining in the fun. Then, just up the road, Herter and Hunter Ray had their own accidents and took themselves out of contention as well. With crashed Indy cars strewn all over the circuit, the sport opted to red flag the event with four laps to go. So, let's get this out of the way, as it's the bit that all the regulars seem to come here for. I should probably add Peterson to this at some point, shouldn't I? So, once again, it would be a late shootout for the win at Nashville, with Kirkwood and McLaughlin failing to disappoint. Kirkwood got away well, but Scotty Mack was keeping the American honest. And as we got onto the last lap, the 33s were right on the diffuser of the Andretti. Though, after a hard-fought battle, it was Kirkwood crossing the line and taking his second IndyCar win. As he went to have chicken dinner, there we have it then. The trilogy of the Music City Grand Prix wreckfests has finally come to a close. 
If I had to be honest, this was probably the weakest of the three, though that by no means is to say it wasn't a great race. The closing laps especially were great fun to watch. As for the championship picture, Polo finished ahead of Newgarden, so in all honesty I think Joseph's fighting with Perez here when it comes to the quickest championship comeback attempt we've seen in recent years. That said, we still have four rounds to go, so who knows? And of course, I'll be covering all of those, so don't you worry. If you enjoyed the comedy review though, I'd really appreciate it if you dropped it a like and got subscribed to the channel for more videos in the future. Right, I think we've got a bit more to talk about this week. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that's jokes hit harder than Stingray Rob hits the wall every week. <laughs> now it may be hard to believe, but the IndyCar season is almost at a close, and with just four rounds left to run, it was time for the sport to return to its home the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What followed was a crazy weekend from start to finish, kicking off before the cars had even hit the track. So let's cover the news. Friday brought with it some big news surrounding Maya Shank Racing. The team confirmed that they were putting Helio Castroneves into a care home this week, with Tom Blomquist returning to the IndyCar fold full-time from 2024. Simon Pagano was taking yet another weekend to recover from his mid-Ohio crash, and back in the number 60 was Linus Tech Tips over here whose career I covered in a separate video earlier this week. That's not even a subtle plug, the video tanked, so some love on it would be massively appreciated. Now of course, there was one more, arguably even bigger story in the IndyCar paddock, and while it technically all kicked off on race day, it makes more sense to cover it now. And that's the news that Alex Pillow has changed his mind again. I'll be honest, when I read the news that Pillow had snubbed yet another IndyCar contract, I was kind of frustrated, and after everything that kicked off at the back end of 2022, I just didn't care anymore. Just in case you've been living under a rock for the last 12 months, last season it was rumoured that Alex Pillow would be off to McLaren, until Kingpin here turned around and said something along the lines of, I don't think so. The Chip Ganassi team, as a result, went to take their own driver to court mid-season, until at some point Pillow turned around and said they were all happy families again. But he was still jetting off to McLaren for 2024. One year later, Polo has changed his tune yet again, ditching McLaren and his management company to presumably stay with the Ganassi fold into the long term. The whole palaver has made McLaren act like the age of one of their average fans, all the while the bosses over at Alpine are wetting themselves in the distance. I really don't know who's in the right anymore, but as I said earlier, I don't care, so let's get on to practice one. This session, the only one before qualifying I might add, ended with a surprise at the top of the table in the form of RLL's Graham Rahal. Benjamin Peterson was also struggling to drive, though we're more used to that. Peterson, in fact, despite coming back to a track he's driven in IndyCar before, was making more of a hash of it than he usually does. Pato Ward was also in trouble, not that the commentators seemed to care. For whatever reason, they'd picked up a grass fetish over the week off. Into the beautiful grass here. I mean, you can get on that grass, and even if the grass is a little bit wet. Off the grass. See them. Isn't this the smoothest grass? It's the smoothest the grass. Road I'll give you that. I'll no argument there. I mean, look at that. That thing looks like a putting green. It's like a gust of green right there. Anyway, we'll move on to qualifying, and this would be a very important session for championship contender Joseph Newgarden. Trailing in the standings by a country mile, the American needed a good result here. So let's see how he gets on, never mind he's gone out in round one. Newgarden would be the first of several shocks in qualifying, with Power, Herter, Kirkwood and Dixon failing to even get into the fast 12. Then Devlin DeFrancesco shot to the top, and I began to question the reality around me. That P1 from Devlin would be no fluke either. The Canadian would then book himself a place in the fast six, as Ray Hall and Lungard provisionally locked out the front row. Nah, sorry, if one of you drugged me or something, this is ridiculous now. If you were the likes of Grosjean, Rossi or Ward, you must have been laughing about now. You'd be thinking the Fast 6 was actually just a Fast 3. And in fairness, after that it was. Though neither of those three would be in it. Come the end of qualifying, the provisional front row stayed as it was. As Graham Rahal, at the site where he was a blubbering mess on Indy 500 bump day, took pole position. Surely this weekend cannot get any crazier. As it turned out... Oh yes it could, now we'll get to that, but first we have another practice session to cover. This was topped by Dixon, who must have been wondering where this pace was a few hours earlier. 
Other drivers still seemed a bit in the dark though. Marcus Ericsson trying to go quicker just by taking the oval layout instead. After the ridiculousness we'd seen so far, Arena's VK wasn't even sure what category he was in. As it looked like he'd set his Indy car up for a Formula Drift session every time he went into Turn 1. We would be focusing on neither of those as the cars lined up for the green flag, as all of our attention was devoted to one man and one man only. Let's go racing in Indy! This is the Gallagher Grand Prix! And Graham Rahal with a bright start! Lundgaard is being challenged on the inside! Three behind, three wide, you see both McLaren's now four by Devlin D. Francesco Baby all the way to the lead from his career best start. He's side by side with Rahal and Dev takes the point! Unbelievable! Now I can't begin to work out how Devlin did that, so I'm just going to put it down to obvious doping. So as Devlin D. Francesco shot off into the lead, still can't believe I'm saying that, there was chaos behind. Alex Pelot embracing his new Ganassi contract by punting around his teammate prompting Newgarden to just give up on the championship and have an affair with Marcus Armstrong. At the same time, Dixon was spun around and Grosjean decided he just wanted to be the cuck and watch Armstrong and Newgarden go at it. Rather unsurprisingly, the pace car was out and we wouldn't be ready to race again until six laps later. And we don't get to say this very often, it's Devlin Di Francesco in the Andretti Steinbrenner Autosport Honda leading the way over Graham Rahal. Yeah, I'm still not over the fact this happened. We'd be brought back to reality soon enough as Devlin's drugs wore out, he dropped further and further down the field, eventually ending the race in 20th place despite there being no calamities on his end whatsoever. This race has somehow managed to make him look even worse. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So as the RLL cars re-inherited the lead, the shocks would continue, as Stingray Rob managed to get himself into the top 5. Now I get some cars had pitted, but this is still impressive stuff. And what's even more impressive was how he was able to tweet at me while still driving the car. Back to the real world then, and everything was looking rather dandy for Ray Hall, Letterman, Lagan. They held a comfortable 1-2 by the halfway point, though we're now coming up to lap traffic, including Benjamin Peterson who through some feats of nature had managed to go four laps down already. Luckily, Peterson peeled off into the pits before he could cause any more damage. Further down the field, though not quite as far down as Peterson here, Scott Dixon came into the pits, and to begin with, no one paid much attention. And then we realised he was going to the end. And then we realised he'd managed to cycle his way up to the very front of the pack. Ray Hall would box from the lead with 23 laps to go, and whilst up to this point the win had looked to be his on the plate, now things weren't looking so certain. The American had an 8 second gap to close, though Dixon in the lead was conserving both fuel and tyres. Backmarkers in the way weren't making Graham's day any easier as well. With 4 tours to go, the gap was down to 1.3 seconds. With 2 laps, it was 0.3 seconds, and by the white flag, Ray Hall was right on Dixon's tail. Could he end his six year winless drought, or would Dixon go from last to first and claim his first win on the year? At the end of 85 laps, it would be Dixon crossing the line in first place. You know, for a race that saw no cautions besides the mating session on the opening lap, that was pretty bloody amazing. Scott's win propels him now into P2 in the championship, and I don't know about you guys, but that kind of surprised me. I was under the impression he was having a bit of a subpar year, though really he's just been quiet and consistent all season long. Bit like Peterson here, except he's just been consistently shit. As for Ray Hall, I'm sure he's gutted, and you know what, fair enough. That race looked to be his for a lot of the time. But he's got to be buoyed by the form his team have found over the course of this 2023 season. Next up, IndyCar heads to World Ride Technology Raceway for the last oval race of the year, and presumably the last chance for Joseph Newgarden to have some form in 2023. You can bet I'll be covering that race too, so if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to get subscribed for all of that. We've only got three IndyCar races left this season, and with Alex Pelot doing decently well, while Joseph Newgarden does cool, this championship's looking pretty safe for the Spaniard here, who'll need that prize money to find lawyers high enough to unravel his latest contract saga. As the series headed to St. Louis, however, all eyes were on New Garden, the American cleaning up around the ovals in 2023 and set on claiming victory at the last one at Gateway. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the comedy review, and I'll tell you now, that's not quite what happened.
Before we get into the action, let's cover the news, or whatever's going on at Maya Shank Racing, since that's basically all this segment seems to be nowadays. Simon Pagano was out yet again, and we got confirmation after the weekend that the Frenchman will be sat on the sidelines for the rest of the year. Linus Tech Tips was back to fill in once again, with Tom Blomquist inheriting his ride early for the remaining two rounds of the season after this. That's not the end of the driver transfer saga, however, as City's season was kicking off early at Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan. Let's be honest, Jack Harvey hasn't had much of a mention in this series, and that's because whilst he's not been making a name for himself, like some people in this field, that's not to mean he's been particularly quick either. In fact, a commenter the other day referred to him as Back of the Pack Jack. <laughs> I can't lie, I've gutted the money learning of that nickname now. Back of the Pack Jack would see his IndyCar deal terminated prior to the race at Gateway, with RLL aiming to sign someone a little faster to close out the season. Can someone explain why they've settled on Connor Daly then? He would make his debut for his third team in 2023, as IndyCar geared up for practice then immediately gave up with the track looking more like a swimming pool thanks to the weather. With it being too dangerous to send Benjamin Peterson anywhere near the circuit in these conditions, we had to wait nine hours before everyone was able to test the waters. And this would be a rather important practice session, with IndyCar using the red sidewall tyres on an oval for the first time. That didn't lead to as much chaos as you might have expected throughout practice though, well, apart from this, but we'll get there soon enough. Graham Rahal wasn't having the most fun of times as he complained something felt wrong with his number 15 car. Maybe back of the pack Jack shit in it or something. Colton Herter and Takuma Sato had near-death experiences as well, and how both of these guys kept out the wall here, I have no idea. Besides that though, there wasn't a whole lot to talk about, to the point where the commentators had moved on from their grass fetish at Indy the other week to discussing the font on Will Power's steering wheel. Maybe Power was being distracted by this too, as when he saw a rogue Scott McLaughlin too late, he piled into the outside wall. Power then slid down the track into the path of Marcus Ericsson. The Swede had just agreed to leave Ganassi for a driver Andretti next year, and gave his husky chocolate car an app send-off as he drove into the side of the damaged Penske. With no spare chassis, Ericsson's team had to put together an almost Frankenstein car for the remainder of the weekend. That must have scared the rest of the field, as it now looked as if Alex Pelot had multiplied. I've now got that, now there are two of them Star Wars seen in my head, but we'll have to leave the obvious racist stereotypes for another day, I think. Let's get into qualifying then, where Daly shocked the field by momentarily going P1. This looks great, though then you have to look at the drivers he's ahead of at this stage. Friend of the show, David Malukas, was in his happy place once again, and displaced Daly for P1 a little later on. It would be the number three car of Scott McLaughlin, however, who ended up setting the fastest lap average and lining up on pole position for the race. It looked like no one would stop the 33s, well, apart from penalties, and he wasn't the only one. Scott would be amongst six cars penalised for engine changes coming into this round, and thus the pole sitter would actually start 10th and promote championship hopeful, or more like dreamer at this stage, Joseph Newgarden, to the P1 spot. As we gear up for the race then, this is my time to throw in a shameless plug about 67% of you not being subscribed. So if that's you, what the f*** are you playing at? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was too harsh. Generally though, if you're enjoying the video, I'm trying to get as close to 100k as I can before the end of the year, so clicking on that subscribe button down below would really come in handy. Right, now onto the race. With this being an oval, that meant Ed Carpenter was back in the field, and as the green light waved, it became clear he had been paying attention. His first point of call being to remove Benjamin Peterson from the running. With his loyal sacrifice made and the rest of the field feeling a lot more comfortable with the 55 car on the sidelines, we went green again, Newgarden holding the fort out front as Malukas slotted up to third. Linus Tech Tips was also on the move, well, trying to be on the move at least, an attempt on power turned into a failed defence against championship leader Palo. But once again, hats off to Lundqvist for getting into the top 10 on his first oval to begin with. Further back, things weren't going so swimmingly for Takuma Sato, who was stuck in Sunday drive mode as he seemed to let the entire field by on lap 55. We were entering the first round of stops around now, and it will be no surprise to tell you that the first to chew through his tyres was Colton Herter. This undercut paid off, however, 
as the 26 was able to cycle back up to second place. Newgarden, meanwhile, was locked in an intense fight with Patawo Ward for the top positions, with the Penske man just able to fend off his rival for the time being at least. You see, Pato was relentless until Ed Carpenter decided he wanted to be a menace again and shut the door on the McLaren driver on lap 111. Thanks to Ed wiping out Peterson though, we wouldn't see another caution until lap 123. Takuma Sato had been playing with fire all weekend, though this time he bit off more than he could chew as he got into the marbles and decided, eh, let's just hit the wall. At this stage, Scott Dixon was in the lead and he would pit under the yellow along with Newgarden. Ericsson was also in, but found out Indy cars can be a little hard to control when you only have three wheels on the car. The chaos on pit road didn't stop there, as Augustine Canapino got his five seconds of fame when he nearly ran over one of David Malukas' mechanics. The mechanic in question responding by just kicking the Argentinian's car. We get going again, with Dixon driving off into the distance as Newgarden and O'Ward went back to killing each other. Malukas then made a great move on the outside of McLaughlin, which, as we know, even champions like Will Power can struggle to do. Strategy was now coming into its own, with half the field aiming for two more stops till the end of the race, and the other trying to sip at their fuel like some stereotypical British person sips their tea. That's completely bullshit, by the way. Anyway, one of these drivers was leader Scott Dixon, and the master of fuel saving was going to have to once again pull out all the stops if he wanted to take his second win on the year. He finally came into the pits with just 64 laps left to run, and his call seemed to pay off when he managed to lap Roman Grosjean, who was about as present in the action of this race as his Andretti contract is for next year. Things really weren't looking good for Newgarden then, and maybe the Americans saw this too, as with 49 to go, he admitted defeat on the championship and ended his title hopes by crashing into the barrier. That all paved the way for Scott Dixon to take a comfortable second victory in a row, throwing himself back in as an unexpected upset in this title race. That said, Pelot would need to do something monumentally stupid for this to actually happen. Still, the old veteran still got it lapping the whole field besides O'Ward and Malukas, who made up the podium. A pretty fun race then, and if you enjoyed my review, like I said, I'm aiming for that 100k mark, so help me get a little bit further to that by subscribing down below and pressing some of the other buttons down there while you're at it. The penultimate round of the IndyCar season would take the sport to Portland, uh, one of my favourite circuits on the calendar mainly because of the first corner having the special ability of causing utter chaos. With a silly season and an X racist to add into the mix, we've got a lot to dive into. So, hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1, the comedy review, and roll the intro. Right then, let's start with the news, and if you're wondering why this video is so late, it's this section and the dread I feel trying to cover it all. With Formula 1's silly season about as exciting as Chip Ganassi in bed, before he flattens you, and anyway, the point is, IndyCar's driver market has more than made up for that. Despite Pelot likely remaining at CGR, some big seats are still available. One of the most popular of these was Grosjean's spotter Andretti. The Frenchman had a superb start to the year, which was only curtailed by unlucky crashes and incidents that weren't really his fault, then by more incidents that rather were his fault. That, plus Chip Ganassi taking money out of Ericsson's contract for Pelot's impending court battle, led to Marcus making the jump to Andretti for 2024, and the Phoenix being tossed into the dirt. Ericsson's spot would then be taken by Linus Tech Tips here, and I'm glad. For him, obviously, but also now because one of my videos will age well for once. Grosjean, meanwhile, has been linked with a reunion with Dale Coyne Racing, which sadly means the demise of Stingray Rob. Looks like that's the end of my IndyCar coverage then. Now that's all for 2024, but the silly season doesn't really stop there, as after suffering one round of Connor Daly, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan decided it would rather field a racist for the remaining two races. Yuri Vips hasn't driven a race car since leaving a championship that openly admitted to wishing he would f**k off. However, having gone under some BS PR rehabilitation, he's been fired a lifeline. Interestingly, we never hear from him on the radio though. Guess that was too much of a risk from the NBC crew. On the bright side, we did get this stunning summary of his racing career. 
that looks like it was made on PowerPoint. That was shown during practice, and rather interestingly, IndyCar have now extended their highlights packages to these sessions to almost half an hour. Rather confusing where they found the highlights from though. I'll be honest with you all, practice one was a little bit boring this week. A few cars straight line turn one, and Rosenquist forgot he still had one weekend left with McLaren as he straight lined it into the wall, but otherwise, that was pretty much it. Oh, and Ryan Hunter raised dementia kicked in. But yeah, besides that, all else you need to know is that Lungard topped the session. And enjoy looking at his name at the top of the standings, because he becomes completely irrelevant after this. P2 would at least be a little more interesting, as Grosjean decided it was time to do Grosjean things, even bringing Callum Eilot for a ride towards the end. We'd have red flags too, and having managed to go a whole video without mentioning his name at all last week, Stingray was back to his best here in Portland. We likely won't have many more opportunities to use this, so enjoy. Some drivers had a bit more skill, however, Will Power pulling a pretty impressive save later on. It would be teammate Scott McLaughlin, though, who topped the session, with Joseph Newgarden finding some pace again, just a little too late after being bumped from the championship last week. Newgarden clearly remembered this come qualifying, as he chose to make sure he was definitely out of contention by beaching his car in the barriers early on. Grosjean was another to go out early, as he exploded Bahrain style towards his mechanics, which, if you didn't know, is Racing Driver 101 when you're in dire need of a seat next year. Yuri Vips, meanwhile, was trying to take his career to some sort of height through Turn 1, and Marcus Ericsson thought he saw Will Power again and got scared driving over onto the grass. Incidents sure were a plenty in this quali session. Here's Benjamin Peterson continuing not to use his mirrors and finding an alternative way to look behind him. Bit strange this really, as he's usually last anyway. As we got to the fast six, however, it was Graham Rahal once again taking pole position. Not gonna lie, that doesn't hit as hard as it did a few weeks ago, but congratulations and yep, let's watch NBC show the video of him crying again. Rahal later came out warning his rivals that their race car was going to be even better. Rahal finished 12th. We'll get to the rest of the race in a moment, but first I want to beg for some subs. You see, I'm trying to get the channel to 100k and make this my full-time job in the process. If you'd like to help out with that, then subscribing down below would go a super long way. Thanks to everyone who did this after the last video, as we genuinely saw some of the best growth this channel has ever seen in the god knows how many years I've been doing this. Now back to the action. Portland Turn 1 has always seen tons of drama, so in a year where Stingray Rob, Benjamin Peterson and Yuri Vips all line up on the same grid, apparently nothing happened. Rahal held the lead as Polo got past championship rival Dixon, and as usual we got our customary super side-by-side -side battling all throughout lap 1. The McLaren sure got feisty, pushing each other off onto the grass and causing a smoke screen that launched Roman Grosjean into the air and out of the race, though with his engineers hoping for a bit more peace and quiet, they sent him out 10 laps later to shut him up. That incident didn't bring a caution though, a decision that Will Power clearly wasn't a fan of, as the reigning world champion proceeded to rectify this on lap 3. With the Penske driver a lap down and out of contention, we got going again, Ray Hall leading for McLaughlin and Pelot. At this point, we noticed that the red-walled Firestone tyres were seemingly swapped out for F1's Pirellis over the weekend. Several cars were diving into the box early, and this included Colton Herter, who once again proved that he didn't know what a pit limiter was. This is also where Ray Hall's race would begin to fall apart. He was able to cover against McLaughlin, but by the time Pelot came into the pits much later, he managed to find 10 seconds out of seemingly nowhere. Do I know how he did this? Not a clue, so I'm just going to move on. Pelot's next stop would come on lap 49, though upon exiting the pits, he got a bit forceful with Castro Neves, in a move that in my opinion probably deserved a blocking penalty. IndyCar stewards promptly told me to go f*** myself though. So with the win for Pelot now more than assured, we could at least be treated to some excellent racing further down the pack. Renus VK was sure having a fun afternoon, especially for a man so irrelevant this might actually be the first time I've brought him up in these videos. There was more drama going on in the battle for Rookie of the Year. Marcus Armstrong was looking in good stead despite missing out on the ovals, though his Ganassi crew being secret Canapino supporters clearly wasn't helping him much. Talking of Canapino, he was now in a pretty decent position. Actually, never mind, our boys f***ed it. This would bring out a caution. Eventually, you see IndyCar officials seem to feel bad for Felix Rosenquist for some reason. 
He was yet to box and so was allowed time to pit before the race was neutralised. Shockingly enough, this move didn't make the stewards particularly popular with the drivers. With lap cars giving Pillow a nice buffer and Rosenquist needing to look after his tyres anyway, from there it was a fairly straightforward journey to the chequered flag. Pillow crossed the line after 110 laps to win the race. Oh, what, and the championship as well? Sorry, I didn't think the coverage ever brought that up. Pillow was the first man since Sebastian Bourdais to win the IndyCar title with races left remaining. Not the most famous of names to follow in the footsteps of, but in all seriousness, fair play to the Spaniard. He's driven a hell of a year, and that consistent driving sure has paid off. Can't wait to see him spend those winnings on a lawyer now, though. Some will argue that holding out the caution was a bit sus from the stewarding department, though honestly, I don't really care. Yes, it might have given Dixon more of a shot, but Pelot was winning that title anyway. If not here, then next week at Laguna Seca. We'll head over there next, but if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to drop it a like and get subscribed if you haven't already. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. Nah, I'm, I'm not fine. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that is now followed by the legend himself. As per channel rules, that means Stingray is safe and can no longer do anything wrong whatsoever. And if you're disappointed by that, then don't you fret, Benjamin Peterson is still around. That personal news aside, we do have an IndyCar race to cover today, the last one of the season in fact, so without further ado, roll that intro one more time. So it's driver transfer talk, and once again we've got a plethora of moves to cover as IndyCar headed into the finale at Laguna Seca. The big move ahead of the weekend lied with friend of the show, David Malukas, the Dell coin racer announcing a switch to McLaren ahead of the off-season, and unlike some other drivers on the grid, actually following through with it. That meant one of the Papaya Outfit's three current drivers had to go, the unlucky recipient being none other than Felix Rosenquist. Though he's gone with the Bottas approach to team exits, claiming it was totally his decision to be sacked and move further down the grid. Sure, mate, you keep on believing that. Rosenquist's options look pretty lacking, I'm not gonna lie. However, his sudden availability in the driver market made Maya Shank turn off Simon Pagano's life support and snap up the Swede for 2024. It's a decent signing, though I can't help but feel bad for Simon. Though if he fails to get back on the IndyCar grid for next year, his mid-Ohio antics were at least an audition for the French gymnastics team. Finally, in some non-driver related news for once, the Laguna Seca circuit has changed a bit from last year, with the track being fully resurfaced and in the process being turned into an ice rink. That was more than evident as first practice rolled around, as the field of 27 IndyCar drivers made themselves look a little bit silly. First off the track was Callum Eilot, the Briton doing a very good job to keep it out of the turn 6 tyre wall. Christian Lungard, meanwhile, thought he saw one of his cats in the corkscrew, going on an adventure through the gravel in the process. Both were lucky to keep going. Slightly less lucky was Roman Grosjean, though given how much he and Andretti are getting on at the moment, I wouldn't be shocked if it turned out he'd given them more work on purpose here. The Frenchman was very slightly offline as he lost the rear and went on a one-way trip to the barriers. On a more positive note though, Grosjean's DHL Honda did win one thing this weekend, that being the Hide and Seek award after this practice session. Next to hit trouble was the reformed racist Yuri Vips, whose car revealed it was woke and shut itself down upon reading up on the Estonian's history. With Roman out, there was no real point for Scott McLaughlin to continue as well, so he promptly threw himself into the gravel at Turn 1. Scott Dixon then attempted a similar line just before the corkscrew, before Canapino became the next car to go off. You'd think we'd had enough incidents for one day, though Will Power wanted in on the fun as well, taking things a little too far when he modified his rear wing in the process. It was Colton Herter on top though as practice one came to an end, and the American was on the pace in second practice as well, which turned out to be just as chaotic as the first. The track had been green for just seven minutes before a wild Renus VK decided it was time to take up a new career of being an additional chicane around the Laguna Seca circuit. Though he was able to get going again, the same couldn't be said of McLaren youngster Pato Ward. Now I think there's a whole running gag of American motorsport drivers can't turn right, but enough said. Graham Rahal was off as well, though maybe creating a smokescreen in front of that livery is just a benefit to everyone, and Will Power was about to make it two for two when it comes to bringing out red flags. Yet another would be brought out for Santino Ferrucci, whose car went out for a smoke break with just 13 minutes left to run. 
And with that, the nightmare was finally over. And we could see just how badly the drivers could f*** it up when they were really pushing in qualifying. We had many questions going into this session. Who would have the pace to take the final P1 award of the year? Could one of the drivers leaving their teams after this put on a stellar farewell performance? And when is Ryan hunter Ray going to admit defeat and retire? Captain America, entering his end of Infinity War phase, brought out the red with just a minute and 30 left to go in Group 1. Kind of a similar situation to what we saw in Nashville a few weeks back. With the cars getting one more time lap, not much happened there. Bit of a different situation at Laguna Seca, however. With the track still improving, lap times were tumbling. Even Canapino looked like he might progress at one point, though we were brought back to reality soon enough. Group 2 was just as crazy, with yet another indie stalwart who should have hung up his helmet years ago, reminding us why he was only doing the 500 next year. The big shock loss from this session was Graham Rahal, though if I don't have to see that livery again, I'm not going to complain much. The Fast 12 saw one of the stars of Group 1, Yuri Vips, put in another solid performance, though he would just find himself knocked out of the final session of the day. Pato Award was also trying to find his way in, to the gravel trap and he finished 12th. That left us with a highly competitive far six, and for a time, it looked as if Christian Lungard would make it yet another pole position in 2023. He was denied by the McLaren of Felix Rosenquist, however, the Swede giving his team the best metaphorical middle finger he could hope for ahead of their final race together on Sunday. Cars were out of position before we even got to green, and then when we did get to turn one, it turned out the pre-race driver's briefing seemed to fail to mention what track everyone was meant to be racing on this weekend. It was a particularly disastrous start for the Rahal Letterman Lanigan team, with Vips in the gravel and Graham Rahal done for the day, and apparently wanting to pick a fight with anyone he could find. That hideous livery was out though, and that was a win for everyone else, so tough sh Graham. Now let's get back to the racing. We get going again on lap 7, with a fuming McLaughlin barging his way through the competition, then doing what every Indy car driver dreams of and punting Benjamin Peterson. There was drama up front as well, as Polo took one look at Rosenquist's farewell McLaren story and told it to go do one. At this point, we were 9 laps into the race, which is 9 laps longer than usual before we see Joseph Newgarden have an incident. He would bring out caution number 2 of the day. On the restart, Rosenquist would get back past power, as Polo soared into the distance in what was really just a visual metaphor for this season. At this point, we also got news from the stewards on the start. They decided that they just couldn't be bothered to deal with all the potential penalties, and so were just going to pretend it didn't happen. In other words, the same stance I take with my weight loss. At this point, the race settled down for a while, until lap 26 and Helio Castroneves trying to make someone else win in 2023, spinning and attempting to assassinate Alex Pelot as he rejoined. No surprise that Peterson was part of this as well. We get even more drama just a couple of laps later, as Ericsson piledrived Rosenquist and stalled at turn 1. It looked initially like the pole man had got away with things, then his tyre gave way, and he was back in the gravel as well. Pelot's 2023 luck continued as he made it to pit road just before the yellows came out. That shook up the order for everyone behind. Now Romain Grosjean was on the brink of a podium, and my last video is sure looking in danger, isn't it? I'll be honest, I popped downstairs for a minute at this point, and upon returning, assumed we were still under the same caution period, though little did I know that the cars hadn't even made it to the final corner before Peterson unleashed hell once again. Yes, I'd know this was technically Power's fault, but it's also my show, so go f*** yourself. Further up the road, Santino Ferrucci won Save of the Year, and I can't even slag the guy off this time. <laughs> Crikey. By this point, Canapino was fourth, and Stingray Rob was in the top ten on merit. We'd go racing again, and this time it was Grosjean going off at turn one. That put Canapino into third, and now I was checking to see if I'd just been drugged and Stingray following me was just a fever dream. This was real though, which I knew as soon as I saw Colton Herter try out being a terrorist as he attempted to pass Alex Rossi. Attempt is a very good word in this scenario. Up next on the agenda was pain. The caution was out yet again, and this time it was David Malukas. The Dale Coyne driver was subject to the mercy of Devlin. I don't know how to navigate a corner properly, Francesco. I'll be honest, I doubt that name will stick, but this is why he's not on the grid next year, so who cares? The real loser here, though, was Alex Pelot, who was thrown down to 15th and still had to stop one more time. O'Ward now led from Armstrong and Dixon, who was once again using his ninja skills to silently work his way back to the front of the field. Canapino lost out here as well, with his teammate Calamilot trying to help limit the damage by just blocking the pit lane. 
<laughs> this, this race really just has it all, doesn't it? Should we try another restart then? Apparently not, as Ferrucci and Blomquist had their own separate incidents and the yellows were out once again. I'm not getting any sleep tonight, am I? Caution number six would come in and we would try to go racing. Oh, for f**k's sake. The Chip Ganassi mating session brought out the seventh caution, with the safety car now needing to be refueled because it was being used so much. Anyway, Grosjean would now jump into the lead. Let's just replay that bit from my last video, shall we? We'll see how he does at the final round at Laguna Seca. And actually, now I've made this video, watch him go on to win or something. Well, sh Roman needed to fuel save for a lot of cautions, and luckily for him, Castro Neves hadn't retired yet as he punted off Herta and brought out yellow number eight. In the end, the fuel saving became too much and the Frenchman was forced to box. That put Dixon into the lead and frankly, I'll be surprised at this point now. Anyway, from there on out, the race kind of settled down, though I can't lie, I kind of needed the breather. After 95 laps, with God knows how many under caution, Scott Dixon crossed the line to take his third win of the year, and with that, it was finally over. In the end though, what a race, a fitting end to the season for sure, and the fact that we now have to put up with Formula 1 for our racing entertainment is a bit depressing, not gonna lie. It really summed up though what an entertaining year it's been on a whole, a year that's shown even dominance can be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Verstappen. <clears throat> anyway, if you enjoy the video or the whole series, there's going to be a ton of content over the off season. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate you helping me get even closer to that big 100,000 mark by the end of the year. A huge thanks to all my patrons and channel members as well. And if you'd like early access to some of my videos, or if you just want to help support the channel, then you can check that out through the links in this video's description. For now though, that's all from me. Thank you very much for tuning in, liking and subscribing this whole season, and I'll see you all in the next one.